I don't know. Say it with me. I don't know. Good God, it is liberating. I am a towering mountain of ignorance. I don't know. We're taught to believe that everything has a reason. And so we observe the world, we see what happened, and then we define the thing that happened as the reason the thing happened. But I think a lot of the time we end up mixing up thinking something with knowing something. This is why it can be so impossible to talk about certain topics with certain people. They've tied those suppositions to themselves so tightly with knots of narrative and constructed reality and values that there's just no untying it. And maybe unsurprisingly, in those situations, the best course of action is just to be friends. Maybe even ask them about that thing that they've created because to them, it's immensely valuable. The world as we perceive it, as we've built it inside of ourselves, is a lie that we tell to ourselves, not out of deception, but out of necessity. We have no other choice. We simply cannot understand the world as it is, and so we construct. But sometimes I just have to tell myself the thing that is definitely true, the truest thing I can say, which is that I don't know. This is the Everyone's Agnostic Podcast with Bob Pondillo and Cass Midgley. Welcome everyone to episode 132 of the Everyone's Agnostic Podcast. I'm Cass Midgley. Today, Dr. Bob Pondillo and I interview Blake Coleman. Blake is a local friend who works at a restaurant with my children. This is a bit of a detour from our regular format. We normally focus on our guests' deconversion from Christianity and the pains and difficulties that that entails. But today, because Blake decided all man-made religions, and that's all there is, were false at age 12, we end up talking about culture, religion, and politics in broad general terms, and the three of us end up really enjoying ourselves, and I hope you do too. As one who has adopted what I consider to be a healthy dose of nihilism, and by that I mean an embracing of the meaninglessness of life, I'm often confronted with just how harsh life is and how difficult it is to be a yes-sayer. This motto has a boldness to it that musters the courage to look absurdity in the face and refuse to look away or bury one's head in the sand. However, life is so hard that I have chosen to use opiates as a means of taking the edge off, not unlike people use religion. I'm one who thinks a little depression now and then is apropos, given the harshness of life. Hell, I'm a white straight male with a beautiful wife and kids and living in a three-bedroom house in suburbia. What do I know about the hardness of life? What about Syrian refugees trying to find food, shelter, and warmth for their crying babies? What about people right up the street from me who live in the projects and try to keep the lights on with a McDonald's salary? I complain about my shitty cars, but at least I have one. Obviously, suffering is relative, but make no mistake, everyone suffers. Even the guy with the mansion, private jet, and the 200-foot yacht. Life is hard. Relationships are hard. I often say how miraculous it is that we're even conscious. It's amazing that we're here and sensing these emotions at all. But that doesn't always cut it. Often, unconsciousness sounds better than consciousness. This is why we like to sleep a lot when we're depressed, or worse yet, consider suicide. Sometimes we just have to ride out the dark night of the soul, hoping that that elusive euphoria that comes around now and then is just around the corner. This too shall pass. Saying yes to this existence and whatever form it's showing up as at any given moment is challenged by fatigue and cowardice and apathy. And yet we stay. As Jennifer Michael Hecht wrote, We are humanity, Kant says. Humanity needs us because we are it. Kant believes in duty and considers remaining alive a primary human duty. For him, one is not permitted to renounce his personality. And while he states living as a duty, it also conveys a kind of freedom. We are not burdened with the obligation of judging whether our personality is worth maintaining, whether our life is worth living. Because living is a duty, we are performing a good moral act just by persevering." Unquote. But being a yes-sayer is most applicable to the uber-mensch, the superman. 
to a powerful person who knows who they are and carries a power that affords them the luxury of being a yes-sayer to the real circumstances in which they find themselves. This is not to be confused with the positive effects of also knowing when to say no. If you ever read the Boundaries book, you know that saying no to people, making demands on your life that you did not sanction, is also a bold and brave thing to do. For someone who has lived a servile life, always thinking of others, protecting and serving all those near and dear in their life, it may be time to say no. As John C. Maxwell wrote, quote, Learn to say no to the good so you can say yes to the best. Unquote. Listen to this testimony by Paige Burks on her blog, Simple Mindfulness. Quote, I've been a people pleaser most of my life. I've done what I think I'm supposed to do to make the people around me happy. Needless to say, my own happiness was pretty low on my list of priorities. My thinking was that I would be happy when everyone around me was happy. Funny thing is, that time never comes. Making everyone around me happy is completely impossible. For decades, I didn't understand the core tenets of happiness. No one and nothing outside of you can make you happy. Happiness comes from within. It's a choice. We're programmed to believe that pursuing our own happiness is selfish like we're not supposed to be happy until we make everyone else around us happy first. This comes from the same warped thinking that keeps us from doing things we enjoy because we have to finish all the unfun work that never ends first. I'm here to tell you that those rules are total BS. They've created nothing but misery for millions of people. It's time to wake up to your new, happier way of being. And it all starts by putting yourself first. Go ahead. Be selfish. You'll also be happy. For years, I said yes to everything, thinking I was invincible and could take on more than anyone else, even being very organized and efficient. It's crazy for me to think I could handle this level of stuff, especially other people's stuff. When I started saying no to requests in a diplomatic way or not volunteering by assistance, I felt bad. I thought I was letting people down. The more I said no, the more clearly I could see my healthy boundaries. That imaginary line between helping because it makes me feel good and helping because others expect it of me. The more I worked my no muscle, the more people started to respect my decisions. I say no to things that don't support my values so I can focus my time on things that do. If we're a doormat and say yes to everything, people will continue to expect us to say yes to everything. When we make our boundaries clear by saying no, because that's the healthy choice for us, we teach others to respect our choices. Saying no to something that doesn't serve you opens the space to allow you to say yes to something that makes your heart sing. Unquote. So in summary, the Nietzschean yes-saying motto is talking about life and the brute harshness of it. And even then, life can be so relentless, merciless, and extreme that sometimes saying yes means allowing yourself to be depressed take more naps, maybe even cope with some moderate opiate use, so that you can ride that storm out and survive to see better days. On the other hand, the healthy no-saying that is prescribed by those wanting to achieve a more Nietzsche-esque power status is about saying no to external demands being placed on you by others. Both practices, yes-saying and no-saying, are working toward the same goal, the empowerment of yourself that comes from knowing, loving, and caring for oneself. My admonition is to, one, believe in yourself, and two, put yourself in a community of others who also believe in themselves and where you each can believe in each other. Another great quote from Jennifer Michael Hecht is, quote, we believe each other into being, unquote. Say yes to life and your ability to stay in it despite its brutality and say no to people trying to keep you enslaved in powerless servitude so that you can grow the strength to say yes to what is. We taped this conversation with Blake on November 20th, 2016. We interview people you don't know about a subject no one wants to talk about. We hope to encourage people in the process of deconstructing their faith and curb the loneliness that accompanies it. We think the world is a better place when more people live by sight, not by faith. Please subscribe to our podcast and leave a review wherever you listen to podcasts. 
Our show's available on most podcast platforms. Also, you can support us monetarily in two easy ways. You can pledge $1 per episode through Patreon. That's patreon.com slash EA podcast. Sometimes we have over a thousand downloads a day. Imagine if everyone pledged a dollar. I could quit my day jobs. Also, you can leave a lump sum donation through PayPal at our website, everyonesagnostic.com. The smallest contribution is greatly appreciated. Our opening monologue is an excerpt from a YouTube by Hank Green titled Towering Mountain of Ignorance. The music behind it is Never Know by Jack Johnson. The Segway music on this episode is performed by Sam Mayer on a handpan in the New York City subway. Thanks for listening, and be a yes-sayer to what is, and a no-sayer to what keeps you in servitude. So today's guest... Hooray. So, uh, Blake works at Parthenon. You work at Parthenon. I should right. not talk about him in the third person. <laughs> right. And Parth- that's, a, that's, a, that's a high-end restaurant in Murfreesboro, Tennessee. Yeah, in Murfreesboro. Murfreesboro. For those and, who uh, care. Three out of four of my kids work there and have for several years. I mean, right. gosh, four or five years. I mean, Yeah. Well, that's a great, it's a great place. It really is. Great steaks. I don't know. You tell me, Blake, what, would the restaurant survive without my kids? <laughs> <laughs> Not really, probably no, no. Especially morale-wise, yeah, yeah. The Midgleys kind of keep us in a good mood. It's nice, <laughs> cool. See you there, you done good. So we were chatting at the bar, and uh, we interview people you don't know about a subject no one wants to talk about. <laughs> and uh, because of my own personal deconversion, thirty first thirty nine years of my life, a very devout evangelical minister. And uh, then this uh, crisis of faith, and I, I, throughout those thirty-nine years, I had several <laughs> crises, crises of faith. Crises mm-hmm. of faith. So it was like we say, the death of a thousand cuts. I mean, it was just it was coming. It's like inevitable. Almost, it's, yeah. It is inevitable because it doesn't hold water, and you eventually either continue to self-delude, right, right, or just water it down so much that you can kind of have your baby Jesus in bath water too, <laughs> yeah. or you try to, you know come up with the most honest worldview that you can and, and be a person of integrity about your pursuit of truth, which eventually is going to destroy uh, 99.9% of what faith, you know. And in yeah. fact, I think people of faith would say, oh, it's two different worlds. It doesn't, they don't, you know, because the people that are able to do it, or that we would call a cognitive dissonance mm-hmm. or, or something, they're like, oh, no, they're, they're totally separate. In fact, who was I talking about? Oh, I was talking to Jesse, a friend of mine last night. And he's got this friend who's got two PhDs. He's a professor at Belmont. Mm-hmm. He's at uh, Belmont, which is a... Uh, well, he, yeah. the thing is, is he's Christian. Okay. But he's, he's really smart. And, uh, you know, when, when people try to prop up faith or Christianity using science, he says, no, 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 no. That's, that's yeah. bad for our cause. It's yeah. not true. It won't, it won't work. Right. And so he really totally compartmentalized it as, no, this is not going to hold up to reason and rationale and, and logic. Mm. It's my faith. It's oh, I see. You know, like there's and, no there's no room for any type of information outside of kind of just believing that this is real. Well, yeah. I think some people say it, it's it's just a feeling, mm, and yeah. that's what we would say. And I and I think we could be okay with that. If they'd stop making truth claims. Yeah, that's the biggest problem, I feel like, is um, if you want to believe whatever you want to believe, that's kind of just your business. Yeah. And it's always going to be your business, um, whatever makes you feel well, good. And that's even not, not only constitutional, that's just human. Yeah, that's just a mor- <laughs> a basic morality. Like, You're just free. let people be happy and feel the way they want. It's when it starts um, being passed off as fact yeah. mm-hmm. that it becomes a problem. And because yeah. then, then we're dealing with not actually finding the answers. We're dealing right. with the fact that we already have something that knows the answer, so we don't have to deal with any problems. Or yeah. they, they take that faith and turn it into law exactly. of some kind. Yeah. You know? yeah. Which is like what creationism uh, does. You know, yeah. They want to teach it instead of fact, and it's kind of just not, not where it belongs. No, and I recently watched... Uh, it's an old 2010 movie, I think, but it's called You Don't Know Jack, about the life of Jack Kevorkian. Yeah. Oh, played, right. Played, played by Al Pacino. It's great. It's a great way. flick. It's a great movie. It's yeah. an HBO film. It's great. <clears throat> yeah, yeah, it's great. But you can see clearly that the only reason, I think, that people oppose 
Well, it's not, it's not called euthanasia. What is it? It's um, Mer- mercy killing. Oh, like know. a assisted suicide kind of thing. Yeah, assisted suicide. suicide, suicide just right. deciding when you want to die. Yeah, and, exactly. Oh. And uh, and we do it with animals, and we call it humane. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, you're, you're putting it down. Yeah, you're putting it down yeah. as opposed to because oh, you don't want it to suffer. Yeah, the yeah. veterinarian yeah. is. Imagine the veterinarian who'd have to say, "Well, I can't do anything. You got It's just got to die. Yeah, you know, and it's got to. Yeah. It's going to whimper and. Want, you know, die. And, die and die in a great deal of pain. And yeah, uh, so we do it. We're, we're humane to animals. I just think that's a, the the irony of that is amazing. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. But but the but the drive to oppose him, and this was came out in the movie, and it's it's factual right. and stuff. Was ninety nine percent driven by religion, which is now now to explain that to me. Why 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 won't we be? Humane? I think I think the way Christians look at animals is that that we have dominion over the animal. Sure, and so for we we can put down an animal like we can play God with the animal. we can play God ah. with animals, but we can't. But but humans when we're when we're killing other humans, we're playing God. And so, whereas God has deputized us to manage the animals, He has not deputized us as "Thou shalt not kill." And yet, they're all pro capital punishment. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> which is uh, there's another irony. ironic, yeah. Uh, yeah, a big, big scale. But yeah, yeah um, I don't understand that whole like because when I first heard the story of Kevorkian growing up, it was almost like you could feel his, where he's coming from. I mean, mm-hmm. you get an 80, 90 year old man who's suffered for the past three to five years mm-hmm. yeah. and it's just ready to go. Yeah. Is that really anybody else's business? Right. Yeah. I remember when my mom was uh, dying of cancer in the hospital, my brother and I, my, my father wouldn't do it, but mm-hmm. my brother and I had to go and write those do not resuscitate. Mm-hmm. They have to yeah. sign yeah. those in the event that she has a heart attack while she's passing. Mm-hmm. Uh, don't resuscitate her. You know, and on one hand, it was very, very difficult to do. But on the other hand, it was like I don't want no—I don't want a judge telling me you don't know my mom, you don't know her pain, you don't know anything, you don't know anything at all. You know, so uh, which is an element of big government. Yeah, that would be again something that most conservatives are against, and yet, you know, they want the government to decide when when your mom dies and when she doesn't. Yeah, terrible. Well, and government, I'm, I'm a big government fan. I'm actually a socialist. And so I love it when government gets involved and says people are stupid, there ought to be a law. That's where we show up. Yeah. So, so like, what you know, whenever they've outlawed fireworks, well, there was a lot of house fires or whatever, and so people are stupid. And, and daddy, you know, yeah. the, per, the parental figure has to step in and say no fireworks in the state of whatever. Yeah. Or mm-hmm. in this county. I don't know. But yeah. even lines on a highway. It's like we're stupid. And to get from point A to point B, we need some guidance. And so we're we're you don't think so? No. Well, yeah, I I do think we do. You guidance. would never make it to Nashville from here without those lines, without a wrecking. No, I agree. I no, I do. Okay, I absolutely. And I think we should wear seatbelts too. Yeah, because, because we're we're stupid, and they those... they're going to penalize us for not wearing it mm-hmm. because they're looking out for us. Right, and, and so and that's I like know the that, nanny state. And I'm not. I hate Big Brother. I hate authority. Mm-hmm. I mean, I I love freedom. I'm in in not some ways. I'm almost libertarian in some mm-hmm. ways because yeah. I do think that I I like to self govern. Mm-hmm. I mean, but I don't. I do not have. And this is where another irony. I do not have as optimistic a view of human nature as some of these libertarians have, which mm-hmm. are. A lot of times they're Christians, mm-hmm. and yet their Bible has a, dis, a, a disdain for human nature. I mean, like a total distrust mm-hmm. of human nature. So some of the same people that hate and, and say that we are given over to a predisposition of sin and selfishness, mm-hmm. they're the same people that want to don't regulate Wall Street. Duh, what? Right? Yeah. So anyway, we're off on political shit. Oh, yeah. no. What are you but looking I mean- up? Well, uh, yeah, I'm on my phone. I was looking. Um, I can't find it for some reason. There's a good friend of mine uh, in another county mm-hmm. whose mom passed away. Mm-hmm. And uh, he said, you know, he went to a seminary and what have you. And he put online last night all the prayers that I've said and everything. A good young woman, my mom, passed away. And, uh, basically, you know, but I, and I prayed and I prayed. And, uh, and he essentially said, look, uh, there is no buddy listening. There's, really? There's no God listening. There's nothing. There, it's, you know, good luck to you, and I hope you have a better 2016 than I had, something like that. And then I, I started reading the comments afterwards, and it's exactly what you said, Cass. People are saying, it's natural for you to reject God now, but know that God loves you and those kind of things. Yeah. 
and uh, it made me think of you. Uh, you know, like the first thing is people think, well, you're just mad at God now, mm -hmm. and you yeah. know, eventually you'll get over it and everything will be fine. But it sounded pretty like kind of fuck you <laughs> kind of yeah. like to this. You and know? he was, a, he's a seminarian. Well, he went to Bible school. I don't know what you call that. He has a degree in, yeah. in that, so he understands all that. And I, I saw him as a very religious person. He probably he might still be, but it seems like he's moving so away from that I, thought. I, I'm going to, let me guess. Uh, God's ways are not our ways. Right. You can't understand. Very mysterious. <laughs> yeah. You know, you can't understand. And yeah. Yeah. Don't think you can, and those kind right. of things. Right. Yeah. It, it was God, in God's wisdom, He chose to take her. And by you being angry about that, you're saying that you're smarter than God, that you know better than yeah, God. Yeah, so, it's, you know, it'll pass. It'll pass. Those yeah. kind of things. It made me sad <clears throat> to, to see that because He's such a good, good person, you know, and uh, He has to be saddled with that type of, you know, people not uh, sitting quietly with him and putting their arm around him and saying yeah and just shutting up and I understand letting him vent you know? yeah exactly so yeah. so so Blake you are from West Tennessee yes sir what a small town yeah very small What's very it? small what town uh, Huntington Tennessee mm -hmm. it's in Carroll County so how many yeah. people in your graduating high school class 96 okay. yeah that gives me wow. an idea it's okay so it's a small yeah so super super small town knew everybody since I was five and was able to start making friends till mm -hmm. the time I graduated mm -hmm. for sure. Yeah. Graduated with the same people I went to preschool and kindergarten with. It's wow. kind of cool. Yeah. It was, it was really, really cool. Um, um, it's one of those like give and take things. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, uh, grass is always greener because you have all these great friends that know everything about you, but you have all these people that know everything <laughs> about, about you, you because yes. everybody has something to say. Sure. Yeah. So growing up in that town was definitely, uh, Huh. I don't know. It was a little bit challenging and rewarding at the same time. Sure. Yeah, Church on sure. every corner. Kind um, of thing. Absolutely. Absolutely. I'm like our entire court square is completely bought out and owned by a church. Mm. Whoa. Mm -hmm. Really? Everything except a hardware store and a hardware store, a bank and a uh, movie theater. Everything else is owned and operated by First Baptist Church. Huntington, Tennessee. Yeah. Really? Big, big church. Yeah, wow. Huge. How about hmm. uh, how about your your upbringing? Were you um, did you go to church? Yeah, um, up until I was twelve years old, uh, went to church almost every Sunday. Um, got involved on the Wednesday uh, uh, youth oh, group youth stuff, stuff, stuff like yeah. that, and you know went on the trips, did all that fun stuff. Probably one of my first girlfriends probably came from going to church at the time. You uh, know what I mean? Baptist was it? Or? Um, yeah, it was uh, Methodist at first, and I don't know if that was uh, my mom's doing or what it was. And then we ended up going Baptist. Or going to a Baptist church, and I don't know if that was like a friend switch for them, or if it was just more of a morality switch for my mother, or whatever it was. Uh, but, so both your mom and dad are kind of religious? Oh, uh, my mom dead, actually, when I was 18. Um, I finally was able to have that conversation with him, where it was more open, because he never really has like huge opinions. He's just one of those <laughs> old like, country dudes that yeah. just <laughs> wants to build stuff and then go to bed. Mm -hmm. You know, That's just all he wants to do. So um, we Sounds eventually like a good had guy. Yeah, no, he's a great, great human <laughs> yeah. being. Really funny dude, and he absolutely does not judge anybody on anything. It's kind of really cool to watch. But um, yeah, when we were eight, when I was eighteen, I finally had that conversation with him where we actually just talked because I think we were alone in a car for a, more than an hour. So eventually, something weird was going to be brought up, and that's kind of where it went. And uh, yeah, he just never has believed in any kind of higher power because my grandfather didn't, mm -hmm. and uh, it wasn't like they were purposely going against something. It just they never thought about it being a real thing you know they went to church because my grandmother wanted my grandfather to go or mm -hmm. because my mom wanted my dad to go it wasn't because he felt that he had to get up and he was going to get smacked in the face by some omnipotent force if he didn't go to church you know yeah, you to. know there's the god gene isn't there there's people that have some a, say that yeah well there's people that have a bigger and m more um a hungrier need for meaning mm -hmm. uh life like has to make sense there's an urgency in some people that like i need for this to matter and i need for it to have purpose and direction and meaning i, I you know they're they're just more drawn to the these comments like everything happens for a reason so when they see coincidence they they they, they see into it right they start connecting the dots yeah and then they re they connect them wrong they 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 <laughs> build a scaffolding around you know something that's just a coincidence with all this meaning and it makes them you know warm and fuzzy or whereas a more stoic icier mm -hmm. personality like your dad 
it just wasn't something that he was looking for. Maybe. So nothing he needed. It's not a need that no. some people don't. That's what I'm saying, the God gene. It's like there's this, some people just have a need mm-hmm. for life to have meaning and are really not okay with it not. Yeah. yeah. And so I that's what right. I mean by urgency. Yeah. I think that is, comes with like the, uh, uh, the, the need, or like you said, like the need for something bigger to be going on around you, yeah. but the lack of <clears throat> willpower to actually like, educate yourself in other forms of ways so it's just like hey this really really cool story is happening in front of me and i like parts of it Mm -hmm. so i'm gonna believe in it yeah and i kind of instead of like going out and actually searching for maybe true answers i think the the way you put it as in front of me that's Mm -hmm. in in where i was very similar to you in in rural tennessee rural oklahoma Mm -hmm. and guess what's right in front of you christianity everywhere everywhere yeah and so it, it doesn't it doesn't occur to a young oklahoma boy like me to to be curious about Islam or Buddhism <laughs> or Hinduism, mm-hmm. it's just uh, the answers plopped right down in front of you. So whatever of that appetite for need and meaning you have, it's almost like I'm hungry and a plate is already right in front of <laughs> yeah, you. Yeah, exactly. Right. In, in, but the in stipulations the come with that plate. What's like uh, like what? Like you have to behave certain ways. Oh, yeah. This plate does not get filled again. Yeah, that's true. You don't true. get to eat twice. Did you see once, and then if you mess up, you're not eating again. So the so the baggage that comes with each religion. So yeah, it gives it meaning. Yeah, there's a God watching over. Yeah, there's a trajectory. There's an arc. There's a purpose. There's a happy ending. But in the meantime, you can't masturbate. In the meantime, you, you're yeah. you know you're supposed to observe the Sabbath, or yeah. you know there's there, those are the stipulations. Yeah, and it's maybe. also outlined in a lot of like misogyny, in, in my opinion. Oh like, yeah, a oh. lot of misogyny, a lot of like male dominant, absolutely, um, patriarchy. Ideals. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Mm-hmm. It's it's mm-hmm. it's this ridiculous concept that if you're not a man of any type of power, then you have these very real strict guidelines that you have to abide by to get through and Mm -hmm. it's just ridiculous so talk about that like when when a man is not necessarily exercising his patriarchal authority then he has to he has to what i mean like what did you mean by that last comment pretty much what i was meaning is like if um but you if in the concept of if you were not like the type of man of this era so if you were like a minority of any sort or a woman then you know you were based or you were um prone to become victim to that type of hate and i mean i feel like in most most religions the text is kind of pretty obvious about what they how they feel about women how they feel about minorities or anybody that's outside their realm of people Mm -hmm. yeah and so it's a caste yeah system yeah it's almost like they invented class before class invented class it was was like well if you're not a part of this then you have to be against this and we we don't like you we want our followers to not like you as well i think yeah I, i think that's true yeah and that's an interesting that would be an interesting uh, study, I guess, because which came first, the chicken or the egg, as far as because yeah. they would say, like somebody like Mike Pence would say, this is the natural way. Yes, we're following the norm. You know, it's, we're following nature. They, they would say homosexuality is unnatural. They would say a woman wearing the pants and running the household or right. earning earn, earn income, even yeah. you yeah, know, for sure. some is not the natural way. It's natural, you know, that the yeah. man rule over his wife. Well, I feel like you could almost which argue first. against that too. Well, that's what you're you saying know? is it's like I think they put the cast these they put these roles in place Absolutely. and then said isn't this natural? Yeah, I was just last night strangely I was reading about Hinduism and how that caste system oh, yeah. know, and, and that was part of the Aryan horde when the Aryan horde sort of uh, you know, uh, invaded uh, India or what is now India. Mm-hmm. Um, they brought the, these these strange notions with them. These ideas that you know you're going to be a, you're born into a time, and yeah. that's the way you're going to be the rest of your life. There's no jumping. You can't cast jump. You know, uh, into a, into a different one. That would be unnatural. Think and about the so. toxicity of these three words. Know your place. Oh yeah, it's violent. That is a violent comment. Very, very. If anybody ever said something like that to my nieces or my nephew, I would lose my mind. <laughs> like, it's ridiculous to even say, know your place. Like, none of us kind of know our place. We, don't, and, we have no idea what's going on. But because what's insinu- what's in- assumed in that comment is that it, that person who's saying it has this grid mm-hmm. of places. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And they and, know where the places are. And and this, yeah. is, this is where religion kind of meets a need in people again going back to that god god gene comment that mm-hmm. they have an aversion to chaos mm-hmm. and 
chaos is reality, motherfuckers. It really, yeah. really is. Chaos is the world we find ourselves in. And that is so, not only annoying, that would be a, a minor way of putting it. Yeah. It is so terrorizing to some people that this place, know your place, and the, mm-hmm. you, you know they build up this construct and everybody fits in somewhere. That ends up being, like you said, violence yeah. against the free human spirit. Mm-hmm. Yes, I, I watched a documentary. Or is it, yeah, I guess it was a brief little documentary um, about kind of the journey of Hillary, mm-hmm. and she didn't pass the bar the first time in Washington State or Washington well, D.C. or wherever she was. Mm-hmm. She was in Illinois, maybe. Maybe I don't yeah, remember, well, but whatever. but that's where she grew that up. thing like that. She inserted meaning into that, and it was well. I guess my aspirations were unfounded. And maybe I'm not I'm not qualified for this. And it was it was after that that she decided to kind of hitch herself to Bill and move to Arkansas and you know that whole thing. And she, so she read meeting into that. Well, anyway, she gets to Arkansas, and Bill has run for uh, various offices and mm-hmm. lost a couple of times. And it was a lot of it had to do with people didn't think that she was an appropriate first lady that of she Arkansas. was. Well, yeah, of, of whatever office. I mean, okay. it was mayor of Timbuktu. I don't know, but it was <laughs> okay. there was there was a lot of pressure on her to wear her hair a certain way, to dress a certain way, to to not say things in public or whatever. Mm-hmm. So this is what I mean by violence, and what I think you meant is it's her, you know, forcing people into a category, and of course it comes down to um, uh, systemic racism as mm-hmm. far as this is your place. I'm sorry, but I. I work at Vanderbilt, and I'm sorry, man, but let's just, I've got to say this, and I know this is going to sound so obvious and stupid, but I want it to be shocking. I think I want to be shocked by this, and that is almost every worker in the cafeteria, almost every custodian that comes in at 2 and works till whatever that 8-hour shift is Mm -hmm. and cleans the toilets in my building, all adult black people. Mm-hmm. Older or as old as I am. Yep. And cafeteria and custodians. And this is their place, I'm, I'm, I'm thinking, you know, societally. Mm. This is where, because they, they don't want to be doing that. I mean, I don't know. Right. Yeah. Well, I wouldn't want to be doing it, that's for sure. Well, that's there the, you go. <laughs> I, I don't know. Uh, well, the, the thing we tell ourselves as, as white people is that, that that's their choice. Yes, we well, do to, tell them that. Yeah, I, mean, I do agree that that's kind of like the um, the buyout, almost of like not being able to be guilty about anything. Yeah, because <laughs> if you really look at those communities, um, completely de- like any race living in those communities is not doing very well, or is not succeeding, or is constantly mm-hmm. being pushed down. And I don't, I don't know. Like to me, that's that's a societal way of like kind of. Uh, gritting out or just controlling certain areas or certain groups of people that yeah. may or may not be able to do anything positive otherwise and exactly you know, and that's kind of what it leads to is i um, think it's capitalism i yeah, think it's it money it you is know? that really is the well, caste system in this country for sure because yeah. we have an economy completely based on it which is uh, yeah. you know fine it's a free market's always good but um when now it's completely controlling most uh, levels of government yeah um whether you want to believe it or not you can just kind of look at statistics and uh look at like lobbying yeah. and you're telling me lobbying isn't like passing bills lobbying lobbying isn't controlling office yeah. in each state and in kind of like over the entire country it's just because those people are going to try to control other people and those yeah. people are going to completely keep the same ones down that they constantly be keeping down for what the past sure. hundred years oh, yeah. or the past thousand years to yeah. be honest yeah. with you when, when you think of like uh, big name hip hop artists or um, you know rappers or music stars musical stars and stuff mm-hmm. men women whoever but they always talk about living in the hood and this was their mm-hmm. way out so yeah. money is the thing that insulates and you know elevate you in the culture in some way uh whether you you know whether you deserve it or not that's mm-hmm. that's how it works so yeah. uh yeah and if we have systemic ways of keeping you from making money yeah yeah and force you into illegal practices right. to, to keep up and or, then lock you up yeah strongly for those illegal sure. practices yeah, or if we have if we have systemic ways in our in our political system to make sure that the voter is not heard we will 
do that. We will yeah. come up with something called the Electoral College. It doesn't matter if the, you know, if the giant nation said over more than a million votes that Hillary wins, mm-hmm. uh, there's a way to short circuit that. Absolutely. You know? yeah. So well, there's all sorts of ways. When that, you're talk, we're talking yeah. about going from slavery to Jim Crow, which it was like we yeah. we abolish one thing, but we inst install another thing that absolutely mm-hmm. accomplishes the same thing. Yeah, it mm-hmm. arises. Yeah. So absolutely. nothing's fucking changed. No, no, not even in a little bit. Yeah, it so, arises from, from a law. It, it hid pretty well though. Yeah. They hid the shit out of it, but they didn't <laughs> they didn't get rid of it. Yeah. You know I mean That's in hindsight true. it's pretty clear for us to see, but at the time it looked like progress probably. Yeah, sure. And they were really, really subtle about the way they did most things. Like take oh, the yeah. take education and make it really shitty in those communities. Yeah. And then stick a liquor store on every corner. <laughs> and like, what did you think was going to happen? Yeah. yeah, you know. Oh, sure. Well, this whole notion, you know, Plessy v. Ferguson. This was that big law mm-hmm. that was installed for I don't know, sixty, seventy years, which said essentially separate but equal. Mm-hmm. And out of that arose Jim Crow, mm-hmm. right? Yeah. And then eventually Brown v. Board of Education, and then that changed. And so it just, but you could, yeah. So systemic is the right word. It is in, built into the culture to hold people down. Okay, so yeah. in my mind right now, I mean, I've got several friends that are uh, black listeners of this show, mm-hmm. and we're three white guys sitting around <laughs> talking about this, yeah. and they, I just know that in their minds they're going, yep, you're on to something there, buddy. Yeah. Like, oh, absolutely. I think they, obviously, I mean, I just want, I'm trying my whole life, I mean, at least the last 10 years, mm-hmm. to expose my own personal blind spots. Yeah. And the more you know, the more you know, the more you realize you don't know. Oh, of course. Yeah. And yeah. so there is no end to my privilege. That, Thank you, that, Socrates. Yeah, that's <laughs> true, though. That's very true. That I'm, I'm, I'm learning so yeah. much uh, that, mm-hmm. that is just has been not only foreknown by, the, by these, my friends, black friends sure uh, they they basically and i think this is part of the frustration that i think we feel with black lives matter or whatever yeah. is that they have been waiting and waiting yes and waiting for not only us to get it mm-hmm. i mean well i should say not only for us to fix it but just to get it yeah. like we can't we can't fix a problem that we don't even see yeah, yeah exactly and so societally i think we're, we've got to got a lot to learn yeah there was a brilliant sketch on saturday night live a couple of weeks ago when when uh, Chappelle what? was on dave oh, Chappelle yeah, yeah. and chris rock and uh, all the white people oh. <laughs> are watching the election returns come in yeah and they can't believe what's happening mm-hmm. you know and dave Chappelle is sitting there going well you know that's the way it is that's that's the way it is with us now you know how we feel you yeah. know about uh, it looks like everything's going to be fine but they they pull a fast one on us, and and we're fucked again, pretty yeah. much, you know. <laughs> and that was a really what a beautiful job they did with that sketch. Oh, that yeah. was a brilliant yeah. sketch. Yeah, but it was, it was, to satire. me, it was like something both those guys have talked about for many, many years. What Chris and they, Rock and Chris and, Rock and, and Dave Chappelle, because yeah. like uh, Chris Rock's always been a political, you know, comedy voice out there, yeah. Yeah. and Dave Chappelle's always kind of been on this side of like radical. Um, <laughs> um, <laughs> I'm going to talk about race in a way that's going to make everybody uncomfortable, but exactly. it's going to get everybody talking about it. Yeah. And they kind of came together and did this brilliant, brilliant skit, like you said, uh, that kind of just shoved it in everybody's face <laughs> on a very, very public platform at that point. You know, SNL has always been one of the most viewed shows in American media. And yeah. um, certainly you, around election time. Too. Certainly very around. Big, yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. They love it. And um, <laughs> I do want to say the beginning of that SNL uh, episode when uh, she's doing her Hillary and doing the tribute to uh, Leonard Cohen. Yeah, mm-hmm. right. Right. That was amazing. But uh, wasn't that interesting? That was yeah. so beautiful. And like weirdly, because I thought it was going to be funny and it was not. And no. it was gorgeous and it was great. For those and, who don't know, uh, Hillary or uh, Kate McKinnon, who plays yeah. Hillary on the show, uh, played uh, Hallelujah. Right. Yeah. By, yeah. yeah. And Cohen had died that week. Yeah. And, yeah. and so it was two birds with one stone. And, and then at the end, she turned and said, you know, I'm not giving up. You shouldn't either. Or something like yeah. that. Yeah, exactly. So a lot of people found that very cheesy, too. I was reading online. I thought it was good. Yeah, I, thought it, I thought it was a really yeah. perfect way to kind of start off that show, especially with the the route they went with the rest of the show. I mean, I thought it was beautiful. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, well done. Well, yeah. I think they had to address the sobriety that that yeah. at least the SNL audience was feeling after the election. Yeah. Oh, yeah. You know, those are oh, like, yeah. No, they're liberal. So we are, we're people. wanting to sure. sing a dirge. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And yeah. then Cohen, the author of one of the most beautiful dirges of all time, which mm-hmm. is a fascinating story behind that song. I didn't know. I don't know the story. There's an episode of Malcolm Gladwell's podcast, um, revisionist history revisionist, or 
I don't. I can't know. I yeah. never know if it's through. <laughs> anyway, Malcolm Gladwell. There's a whole episode about that song and how it came to be, and how. Really? Yeah, it's fascinating that the the just the journey of that one song huh. and how it. You know, it really wasn't that great a song when it when Cohen first wrote it, and uh-huh. there was some a lot of adaptations and stuff. And there's like seven verses to it, I think, in reality. But anyway. Yeah. I think they're trying, they were trying, I mean, they're a comedy show. You know those times on Daily Show when Jon Stewart would come out after fucking 9-11 or even like some shooting, Mm -hmm. and he would be like, we're supposed to do a comedy show. Yeah. And I'd feel like shit. Yeah. And so how do we do this? And I think that's what Lauren was addressing is that we feel like shit. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so how do we, how do we address this? And that's So I like that that, that notion that sing a dirge. Absolutely. And that's what she did. And just go ahead and get it out of the way at the beginning so we can get on with the the show kind of thing. I I think John Stewart would do shit like that too, right? He would just come out and be like, you all fucking suck. (laughs) Now here's my show. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. And I thought, and I think that's kind of what SNL did. It was like a little, uh, it was like a middle finger, like with a thumbs up on it. Yeah. It was like, hey guys, we're still here with you, but fuck everybody else at the moment <laughs> because this is ridiculous and absurd. Yeah. And now let's go do this thing that we planned on doing the whole time. And then yeah. Dave Chappelle just absolutely comes out and gives one of the best monologues I've ever heard yeah, in my life. Yeah, it was great. It was super emotional and beautiful and funny. And funny. And just great. Yeah. 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 And that that's what makes it so accessible when you're funny, I think, you know. Yeah. You go, oh, yeah, you I can talk that. about whatever the fuck you want. Yeah. Yeah, George Carlin, like, he told, said whatever he wanted on stage, but he made people laugh at the end, even though he was saying very real, real things a lot of the mm-hmm. time. You know, well, Bill that's Hicks why... is another one of those guys. Oh, yeah. yeah. Oh, Bill Hicks in particular. Yeah. Amazing guy. So do you think then, uh, this is one for you, Blake, do you think that the, the comedians of our time, the Bill Mars, the whoever... Uh, Chappelle. Chappelle. Chappelle, all those guys... Anyway. The comedians of our, are the are the prophets of our era. Yeah, absolutely. Social uh, social philosophers, like um, entertaining philosophers, in my opinion. Like yeah. they they have all these ideas, but they get to get it out because nobody gets to say a fucking word when they're on stage. Mm-hmm. And I dare you to to say a word yeah, while these guys you're, are on you're stage. Called they're a heckler gonna, when you yeah, do. They, and they are going to tear your ass up and probably get you kicked out. <laughs> yeah. But they get they get they have a, a chance to that a lot of people don't have, and it's a chance to voice their opinions on yeah. things. Yeah. And a right. lot of these guys just sit around and think. And people don't realize that. I think I think comedians are some of the smartest people Absolutely. on the planet. Incredible. They, oh, they have to be. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Even in, You've got to be able to see both sides yeah. and see the hypocrisy, the, the and, nuance, and there's the humor right there <laughs> yeah. between what's supposed to be and what is. Yeah. The hypocrisy is the funny. Yeah. Is the funny part. I think to be so. a good author, to be a good comedian, kind of takes one skill that both of them need to have, and abilities to kind of exist in the world but spectate at the same time. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Where yeah. you kind of just, you know you're in the middle of the conversation, but you can see how other people are reacting you're yeah. watching you know and yeah. a lot of people don't have that ability because a lot of people are so involved in like their self or the conversation which is beautiful you know always stay yeah. in the conversation but some people are able to just kind of like spectate around the room while mm-hmm. trying to participate in the event that's going on yeah, yeah. and i think to be an, a, good, a great author or a great comedian kind of takes that ability because you have yeah. to see this fucking world that people aren't yeah looking at and then you have to bring it to their attention and be like oh shit I did think about that mm-hmm. one time you yeah. know yeah. and then people really and, they're, and they're very clear thinkers too. very clear I mean it's it's easy to understand when the comedian says well that's the know? thing is and that's that's, yeah. a, that's a skill another yeah. word for yeah. prophet is seer so right. they see it mm-hmm. and then they have the articulate <clears throat> skills yeah. to pr- present it I've, mm-hmm. I've often thought because you, Bob you and I uh, mm-hmm. do you have any degrees did you ever go I to don't no 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 I, I got, well you'd be great in college got if you ever want to go hella great at uh, partying when I was uh, going to college yeah, <laughs> oh. <laughs> yeah. which, uh, which I'm, I'm gonna say was a stupid stupid idea but it's also led me to some of the best friendships and kind of the path of growth that I needed in my life not yeah. one that I necessarily wanted but one that I needed for sure kind of a smack in the face that definitely needed to yeah. happen to me well mm-hmm. the reason I allude to academia for a second is mm-hmm. that um, a lo- I'm sorry that a lot of the stuff that those geniuses write is never going to be read by the public so so the comedians really are kind of the that voice the translators yeah mm-hmm. the Absolutely. translators yeah. so they're seers and then I love the fact that true prophecy or true oration into the culture is holding up a mirror so mm-hmm. they they see but then they they, they mm-hmm. hold it back up to you to you can see not just what they're saying but you can see yourself in what they're saying yes, yes. yeah absolutely and that's healing because mm-hmm. i mean as far as i don't know trying to shave and i'm i'm missing spots you know mm-hmm. because i can't see my own face and i think mm. the culture politics religion relationships marriage friendships everything mm-hmm. you've got to you've got to 
understand or at least try to understand how people are experiencing you mm -hmm. because you because of blind spots sure yeah. kind of going back to racism i mean just... and i guess people some, some people don't like comedians you know they don't, they don't like what they have to say there are very few conservative comedians out there maybe yeah the whole I can't uh, think of any actually. like jeff foxworthy yeah. okay foxworthy those foxworthy guys. those guys are definitely on the conservative side yeah of, of okay but dance. even what he did as far as like he made famous you'll know you're a redneck Right. Is he was holding up a mirror back to these people. Yeah, which I think you do need that ability. But he also um, says some pretty single-minded things. I really wish I had, like, a Jeff Foxworthy memory so I could just <laughs> go ahead and, like, pull out of it. But, like, I've definitely listened to him and been in that realm of, like, uh, you would only think this in your situation. Exactly. Mm -hmm. That's, That's what I mean by blind spots. I mean, this guy that does um, – uh, he's he's got – quite a voice these days at least especially with conservatives but he's the guy that did those he did that tv show reality show where uh it was like uh, it's not odd jobs but like sucky jobs or oh, oh dirty, dirty jobs dirty, dirty jobs. jobs yeah <clears throat> so he goes into these places where he's knee deep in manure or yeah. whatever yeah, right. yeah. but he's he's stores, got a real conservative stuff. slant and and anytime i i'm sorry but i'm i'm just to that point where if a white straight male is talking and <laughs> The problem is, is they know so little, and they think they know so much. And I'm yeah. one of them. I'm one of them. Hmm. I'm standing here confessing that I'm that guy. <laughs> and so, I, I, you know, a lot of what comes out of their mouth when you use the you use the adjective single-minded. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, I mean, it's just they've got one perspective, and it's the it's the right one. It's the only one, and everyone <laughs> needs to conform to my perspective. Yeah. When you've got when in fact you've got giant blind spots. Yeah, yeah. yeah. that was no, one of the true. convenient things about where I grew, or like uh, the people I had around me when I was growing up. Because um, on one side we have like my dad's family, who is um, pretty much like white America. Yeah. It just it just it's there. And then my, on my mom's side, you have this like outlawish backdoor to that same America, but they live amongst other people. So like, I have my cousins who grew up in the ghetto that I went and visited every day. So I had all these black friends growing up. I had um, one of my best friends, George Perez, was a Mexican kid and he was amazing. Hmm. So I got a, a chance actually to see these worlds mm -hmm. growing up. Yeah. So it never was this different thing to me, but it was always this thing we always saw and was like, this is fucked up, mm -hmm. you know? But there's nothing that being, being done about it ever. And like, I complete, I grew up around kids who asked those questions every day. like. Why the fuck are you able to get, have a vehicle and I'm not able to do this? And it's just like I don't, I don't fucking know, man. I really don't. Yeah. Like it's crazy. It's ridiculous, and it was crazy. Like seeing, you know, um, my buddy, on one hand, who has a mom who's looking for a job, finding a very good opportunity here, and then on the other hand, two parents from this from a different household where they're more societally held back are finding jobs with half the pay and maybe having to do twice the work. And yeah. like, that was a very real thing to us growing up and it was kind of fucked up to watch because mm -hmm. it was just like, what the fuck is going on here? So like you, you never really knew, you know, you observe so well, you see so well, I'm telling you, go back to school, study sociology or anthropology oh, or something, man. You, mechanical you, engineering and applied physics. That's what I want to do. You're kidding. Mm -mm, I want to figure out how to make like offshore and uh, like industrialize um, agriculture offshore. What? Well, so we can stop using land. I feel like, you know, we're expanding out and we need to expand up or down, but we have 71% huh. of the earth made of water and we're not fucking using it. Yeah. <laughs> it's and if we're using it, we're using it for oil refineries and shit yeah, like sure, that. Sure. That's completely fucking up those areas. So we don't really have this ability to like grow as people without trying to figure out how to grow as a planet. Blake, too, so. man, you got to do it. Maybe. Yeah. Uh, we'll hope so. Hope so. Well, you're a polymath then because, yeah, we're, because we're, he, he's pretty clear. He's, he's the engineer he's, side and he's yeah, the art, got, artsy side as well. You got both halves of the brain working pretty hard there. That's awesome. Yeah. So I want to go back to kind of the systemic thing you were just talking about, your Mexican friend and your you know, your black friends and stuff. And mm -hmm. I think what, what happens, and, and I know that there's people very critical of like what I would call well, government intervention. Mm-hmm. Like, for example, you your friends might say to you, how come you get a car and I don't? Well, then government gets involved and sets quotas for certain colleges to have so many minorities, you know, mm -hmm. come in. And then yeah. eventually he could turn around and say to you, hey, I got in free and you have to pay. Yeah, but what what they're like, I feel like what they're doing in, inside those minority scholarships, is like they're doing a great job of offering these kids a way to get into college. But then they're kind of like watching them mm -hmm. and making sure they don't fuck up because mm -hmm. you you got here on somebody else's dime kind of thing mm -hmm. and um it's happened to a few of my friends where they were just like you know academic probation gone almost where yeah. it wasn't like this leeway where like some people have gotten and 
I don't know. I feel like there's a good, like, uh, fine print almost that's not actually printed to all those things. No. Mm-hmm. It's well, like, we're going to help you out, kind of. Yeah. I'm, yeah. I'm, not, I'm <laughs> not. So I'm not being critical of these programs. I'm just saying that the people that are critical have some points every now and then. Mm-hmm. But it almost feels, and this is maybe the. Like lit- reverse discrimination almost. That's what they say. Oh, yeah. They? Reverse racism. Reverse racism, racism. Which is not yeah. a thing. I hate that. But anyway, yeah. <laughs> the. Um, almost like. Keep, you know, like for example, we're talking about euthanasia or, or you know, keeping people alive by machine. Mm-hmm. Sometimes we we so damage the culture or the the way that races are structured. You know, with all these places that we've created, mm-hmm. know your place. We've made it such a dysfunctional and destructive system that we are like killing people and then we come up with this false way. So you know, I'm not I'm not a free market capitalist at all, but there is some truth to letting things correct themselves mm-hmm. and there is some truth to when people get get up and criticize government involvement because every time government gets you know mm-hmm. Ronald Reagan government is the problem bullshit mm-hmm. like that. Mm-hmm. But there's there's enough voice to that. I mean, we, Basically, half the country just elected, you know, that believes that shit. Mm-hmm. So, <laughs> which I, you know, because we are the government, we are, well, yeah. the, you know. So, something wrong with us? Is that what they're saying? Oh yeah, okay, that's a whole other subject. Which All their right. fucking is. Yeah. Well, yeah. 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 But <laughs> big anyway. time. But yeah. <laughs> so I'm just saying that I, I wonder if there wasn't a system that was more honest and pure and moral to begin with where everybody literally had equal access to things, and there wasn't these suppressive mechanisms in place, mm-hmm. then we wouldn't need these false compensation mechanisms to come in and, yes. and do it. I mean, so, like, I'm just saying that some of the criticism of those things is valid, mm-hmm. but it goes back to you have a broken system that keeps people down, and then you throw them a bone to, to mm-hmm. you know, compensate for your own guilt or whatever, <laughs> and, and it doesn't always work, uh, mm-hmm. As well as we'd hope, or, mm-hmm. it, that it would have worked it had you never suppressed these people to begin with. Yeah, yeah. No, I get you. I, I see where you're coming from. It's, sure. it, obviously, it's complicated. It's very nuanced, but yeah, it, it, yeah, by trying to improve it, you fuck it up even more. That yeah, happens. You know, that type of stuff. Yeah, like everybody's searching for a way to fucking make it all okay. Mm-hmm. Just make it okay then. Like I feel like it's <laughs> that kind of easy. Like don't uh, stop looking for ways to pass things. I feel like everybody just needs to fucking. Be like, oh, no, yeah, we're all equal. Let's just do this real quick. Yeah. Instead of, like, trying to figure out a way to make it okay. Yeah. Let's just sure. fucking make it like, okay. Let's man, just be you, okay with it. You forget the oh, people want Yeah, that. dumb people are they all want over that the money. Place. They Ooh, do, man. The money. And that that really shows you, you know, if somebody if makes a mistake, I'm sorry, we're in the fucking mode here today. Uh-huh. But if somebody fucks up and, uh, you know, they got some money, there are ways. You can buy a lot of freedom with mm-hmm. that money. You oh, can yeah, buy bro- a lot of lawyering with that money. You know what I mean? Yeah, Brock And then Turner. there's other people... <laughs> Who don't have it, you know, a way they don't have any money, and they're the ones that get screwed. Oh, absolutely, you know, absolutely. So. And we're we're getting into society, yeah, you know, sociology so. here, and I'm I'm the one that took us there, but yeah, I do think it is tragic. I mean, we all we know that my my father grew up telling me it takes money to make money, sure. and it's mm-hmm. absolutely true, one hundred percent. So the people that end up paying the highest interest rates are the people that have the lowest credit and can't afford to do it. They can't Can't afford to do it. Exactly. The people that end up paying overdraft fees are the people that can't keep enough money in their account. Yeah, exactly. And those are usually the people working 40 to 50 hours a week. Oh, yeah. Sure, or more. The system... It's not always, but it it happens. The system punishes the poor and and, and awards the rich. Yeah, you want to know where the highest books, where how much books cost the most? Yeah. Uh, colleges. Oh, yeah. You want to know how much, if you want a cup of coffee, it costs almost five bucks to get a cup of coffee in college. Yeah. Why? Kids, the kids don't have that money. Well, yeah. mommy and daddy do. So, you know, that's, well, that oh, would, they screw them over. Then I could make the argument that we're, that we're actually penalizing the rich there because. Well, yeah, maybe because they do have it, but you would think that, but some college kids aren't rich. Yeah. You know, and they, I'd say oh, the mass majority. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And they got to, yeah. you know, they got to deal with this. So. It makes me upset. But. Yeah, you have 30,000 people. Maybe 5,000 people can actually afford to do this shit. And you got the other 25,000 trying to figure out how to fucking eat. Yeah. Here's my problem with free free capitalism with, mm-hmm. uh, without restraints. I hate this notion of because I can. Like, mm-hmm. why do you charge that much? Because I can. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Hate it. Hate it. I think it's ruining everything. Oh, sure. Because if if people weren't so fucking greedy... <laughs> like the system, there's actually. Oh, I we think celebrate the, money in the country. Though. I think the system oh, would. Yeah. I think the system would work 
But like mm-hmm. this price gouging of books, mm-hmm. it's like, all right, what's it cost for you to manufacture that? Right. What's uh, what's it cost for you to keep your lights on <laughs> and pay your employees? Mm-hmm. And that's your that's your markup, and so you have this decent profit margin that keeps you yeah. pumping out books for the rest of right. A, a well, eternity. we got we got to pay our chairman a five hundred thousand or five hundred five thousand times more than we pay anybody else. Seven hundred so. is it? Yeah, is it seven hundred times? Yeah. Okay, it's well, a, it's still a lot. So. A billion dollar looks a lot better than a million dollars, and that's kind of what their mindset is. It's like, oh well, I know that I'm never going to worry about money again. Yeah. But I want to make sure I really don't. Well, have to it's worry like about these it. EpiPens and stuff. It's like the oh, that, they can like five hundred dollars a pen. They or can do it because they can do it. Yeah, right. And right. That, and that's where I'm like that's why I'm a socialist or something. I mean, I've got a, that's why I don't trust I don't trust humanity. And that's essential stuff too. Stuff that's going to keep a person alive, yeah. a little kid or a guy, you know, a person alive. And you, how could you? I mean, how could you do that morally? There's where religion and spirituality and those kind of notions kind of you know insinuate themselves in well the you've conversation. created you've created so many disconnects by the time you know yeah. by the time the ceo of that pharmaceutical company's you know added a helicopter to his yacht yeah he <laughs> he doesn't see the kid with asthma about to die because he can't afford an EpiPen. Mm. and it, so humanity doesn't have the empathy to care about the fact that they're sharing the fucking planet, mm-hmm. and your your fucking helicopter can go right up your ass <laughs> with the rotors moving, <laughs> son of a fucking bitch. Yeah, sure. I wonder why that is. People don't get it unless it's their kid. Yeah. Well, I think well, they're trying our... to separate like business from morality, and I think that's how they're kind of looking at it. They're oh, probably going right. in like it's just business, guys. Hey, man, it's know. just business. We're not running a charity. Yeah, we're not. You can't just get shit for free. It's like, well, fuck, well you kind of could. Well, where's your where's you, your where's absolutely. your fucking imagination though? Don't, yeah, exactly. Don't you see that this is going to kill somebody? Yeah. If you don't, I mean, you know, it's snap ridiculous. out of it. It's ridiculous. Well, and, and, you know, everybody understands football, right? Yeah. So why can't our culture understand that? You know, there should be referees and if somebody does something wrong 15 yards cleveland you know what i mean i mean you get penalized yeah because yeah. that's the way it happens you just you just yeah. roughed the kicker and got away with it that's not right that's not the way we like do we it. have this sense of righteousness yeah but when it comes to like the, yeah the fucked up shit that wall street does we, we nobody can say blow the whistle and say yeah. that's not right that's wrong they're untouchables <laughs> Yeah, Ooh, that's a whole nother deal. But yeah. speaking of football, it okay. reminds me of something I was going <laughs> to... We're talking about one of the things that Chappelle was big on, the reason that he left the, the industry for 11 years, mm-hmm. was, and you hear this every now and then, as far as the critique coming from the black community to uh, black athletes, black comedians, black mm-hmm. whatever. It's so weird. I was watching the other day in Alabama... University of Alabama, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Roll Tide, all that shit, a, a dynasty of football success. Right. Mm-hmm. Maybe the most successful program in the United States. Mm-hmm. 99% of the players on the team are black. Mm-hmm. That is a crazy racist town, racist state. Mm-hmm. Alabama? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And it's like... <laughs> I see where he, you're going. Well, it's like <laughs> the, the black... You know, we want to entertain us. I mean, yeah. like, you know, you're the jester for the king yeah, or dance, something. dance for us, monkey. And this is what's... Yeah. Uh, and then they buy you. I mean, because right. in, in a professional football and basketball, right. they buy him. So I don't know. I'm just... As where if, I'm going with this is that I think Chappelle said, I'm I'm not, I'm not no longer your clown. Right, right. Yeah, uh, along those lines, for sure. Yeah. yeah. Well, and that and Stewart, John Stewart actually said that too. You know, you go somewhere and they go, "Hey, uh, you know, uh, tell us a joke or something." And what? Do you, and he says, "Well, what are you a secretary? Type me a page. Type me something here." And now, since you're a sec, you know, in other words, your worth is only what you do rather than yeah. just the humanity yeah. that you have within you. Yeah, it's you like I'm I mean? not at work. All right, like yeah. <laughs> I don't unless you plan on paying me the wage that I feel like I should be getting when for this. I'm working. Yeah, mm-hmm. right. I'm not doing it right now, especially on command. Give me a few drinks and I'll tell one naturally. But other than that, like fucking yeah. stop asking me to tell one of my jokes. But I think like, that's ridiculous. important. So the the football players are only valuable in that situation. Yeah, and then and, and elsewhere. You know, no, I'm sorry, you can't eat here. No, I'm sorry, you can't go there. No, that kind of shit. Yeah, and then they get, get hurt that. and you just brush them the fuck off. Yeah, they're just done. No uh, worth worthless to anybody at that point and that's ridiculous to me especially having a buddy who played in the nfl um wow. which he got out he retired last year uh patrick willis played for the 49ers wow yeah uh, but he got out but to me like it's like uh you're only worth something to us 
when you're healthy. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You know, even if you gave us 20 years of amazing, amazing um, entertainment. Yeah. The second you get hurt, you're, How, you're worth it. It's like Muhammad Ali. You like oh, nobody yeah. really even fucking paid attention towards the end of his life. Yeah. And he did. True. This guy did so much for both cultures, in my opinion, like a kind of bridging a gap. Yeah, he really sure. did. Yeah, and it was amazing, and nobody gave a shit. So your friend, uh, is he uh, okay? Did he have Yeah, a, nothing wrong a, with him at all. He just retired. Yeah, he just retired. He wanted to get out, you know? Smart. And he got out in the good way. Yeah. You know, he spent, give or take, 10, or not even 10 years, in the NFL, made his money, and decided, you know, this, this is done for me, this chapter's closed, and yeah. I'm going on. See, that's and, a, and they have a pension. Yeah, yeah. and yeah. that's interesting to me, too. You know, in a culture where you can't say... Like no thanks, I've had enough. You know, it's like we're not we're not allowed to go. We more always more. Oh, we have yeah. to have more. Oh yeah, you can't you know, be happy. No, mm-hmm. no. And if I mean, and I get that because I'd be more than happy to keep teaching if I got more money. Sure, <laughs> you know what I mean. Mm-hmm. But uh, there has there's a time where you say that's all, no more. Yeah. I I I I've, I'm good. Yeah, you can I mean, always... if you're making a hundred million dollars a year, isn't that enough? <laughs> you know, for me, give me. A percentage of that, and I'm happy. Five percent sure. of you that, and I'm just over, yeah, I'm man, ecstatic. I'm cool for man. life. For life, yeah, for life. Yeah, but man, it's hard to do that in this culture, and I think we got to start paying attention to that. Mm-hmm, absolutely, it's just me though. Well, this has been an interesting episode because we've just been <laughs> we, all over the fucking map. I know. Yeah. Have we talked about religion at all? <laughs> but you know, there's an undercurrent of religion throughout the whole thing, though. Oh, absolutely, yeah. I absolutely. think there's a way. Well, that's that's a problem with having like an old religious like uh, community yeah. in humanity in general. Yeah, it's like that's controlled everything we've done almost in our entire fucking existence. Yeah, you know, oh, yeah. If you think about it, and if you're you know creationist, the six thousand years of, of the actual what billions of years that this planet existed. Yeah, it's just been this underlying thing that's yeah. happened in it's community there. after community. Forever. In fact, that whole thing about making money, uh, Weber, that uh, the sociologist, whatever, mm-hmm. uh, was the one that said, uh, you know, because of the elect, because the the, the notion that mm-hmm. you know you're like Protestantism is very aligned with capitalism. Yeah, mm-hmm. and you know, nose to the grindstone, keep working, make money, make money, that type of stuff, and that indicates to God mm-hmm. or to someone that you are going to, because you're better, yeah. you know, so you're going to heaven. Well, so. it's kind of like we've said many times before, the last creature to discover water was the fish. <laughs> <laughs> That's right, because they can't, they can't see the they water. They don't give a shit. <laughs> well, it's, yeah, it's, yeah. The, it's what they're swimming in, and this is the nature of hegemony. Right, right. And we've talked about it over and over on the show, but I think it was alluded to when Blake said, which came first, you know, patriarchy, mm-hmm. you know, this know your place, because it was natural, like it just, that's, that's, actually, yeah. that's actually how it should be, men and women with these different roles, races with these different mm. roles and, and plateaus, which you, you know, glass ceilings or whatever. Or did, is it man's construction? Mm. And we're so steeped in it. We don't. We don't know, it. and I don't. I think a lot of people don't know mm-hmm. that, like they would say, "Oh, it's just natural that the woman stay at home and cook, and the guy go out and earn the it's bacon natural, or whatever." Okay. Well, that's that's, that's, that's the story. Say. That's the yeah. hegemony. That's mm-hmm. the water they're swimming in. That's what I'm saying. So when, when we said, "Have we talked about religion?" Abs mm-hmm. religion has shaped the West. Yes. So yeah. deep that yeah. we even don't though even it know wasn't it. supposed to at all. Yeah. I think that was the whole idea. What freedom. Is it? Freedom, freedom from religion. all that shit. Yeah. Like religion, what religion at the time was kind of controlling taxes and uh, communities. And they were like, well, fuck it over that. I want to get away from it. And then they came over here. And even some of the founding uh, uh, men at the time that kind of shaped America into what it is mm-hmm. or what it should have been mm-hmm. um, rewrote their forms of Bibles yeah. and stuff like that. Well, like Jefferson they, tore out a bunch of scriptures. Yeah. Yeah. And he, yeah, was well, like, he was like, he was like, oh, fucking. Uh, Fairy tale, boom. Yeah, get all rid the of supernatural that. stuff. Yeah, he got rid of all that shit. Not mm-hmm. just think that. What was he called? Uh, I forgot what he called it. But um, how the hell did we become a Christian nation? That's kind of, I guess, what I'm kind of coming yeah. to. Is yeah, Jefferson how, actually thought eventually we'd all be Unitarian. Yeah, and he really thought that we'd all be like or atheist. I and guess. it went kind of back to the thing that they were trying to get away from. Yeah, and it just kind of blew which my is mind. really, in a way, that's not a surprise. I mean, cause really? the, the yeah, because human nature, especially the insecure nature mm-hmm, mm-hmm, of mm-hmm. humans is is the need to be right mm. so yeah there were some people that said to the king and to the uh, the theocracy of, of england you're not going to tell me what to think you ain't going to tell me what to believe because you don't know mm. any more than i know and it's really ambiguous and weird and mysterious and so don't tell me what to think i'll form my own construct god damn it mm-hmm. and so this agnosticism that 
should have come over and said, we, we don't know, mm-hmm. and so you can't tell me, and I'm just going to build my own, and I won't tell you, because I don't know either. So a humility, mm-hmm. a human humility around non-provable things. Right. You know, well, that didn't happen. I, well, yeah, it, you, <laughs> and again, no surprise. Yeah. So there was some people came over and said, I want the freedom to believe whatever. Mm. Well, and then know. the others that came over and said, I want the freedom to believe the truth, the, the right story. Yeah. And so they, they they didn't come over with that humility, that agnostic no. humility. No, in fact, the, the Puritans, you know, the, the, well, the pure. They wanted a more pure sense of Anglicanism. Mm-hmm. So they came over here, and they they everything they hated about England, they <laughs> they created here a new. Yeah. You know, so, uh, <laughs> right, because we you see it all the time. There's well, even like Westboro Baptist. There's religious oh. people. Mm-hmm. Who like the guys that get up on college campuses and call the girls sluts? Yeah, yeah. Boys, what they're so. basically saying is they, okay. I, the street preacher, resent your lack of devotion to your religion. You say you're a Christian, but you're I can see your cleavage from here. You say <laughs> yeah. you're a Christian, but you got drunk last night. <laughs> and their their stance, their platform is Puritan, a mm-hmm. more pure version right. of this. And yeah. this is Westboro Baptist or whatever. Yeah. They want you to be more devout mm-hmm. as opposed to less confident. I mean, it's the opposite. Right. We, we need to be going in a way where it's like, I'm so unsure that what what I believe mm-hmm. is true, like the afterlife, hmm, mm-hmm. nobody knows. Uh, wh- <laughs> I know. Where did we yeah, come from? Kind of stuff, yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, I don't know. Nobody knows. Well, yeah, the guy that comes along and says, I know, he's the stump speed, you know, preacher yeah. that... that, that Presumes to know everything. Yeah, it's funny that you mentioned that. We we were uh, in class. I I teach adjuncts still, even though I'm retired. But anyway, <laughs> we were talking about this, and there was a guy. I don't know if he was from Westboro Baptist, but he was a you know, stump speak, speaker, and they had police all around to make sure nobody yeah. gets hurt. But he was calling whore and the slut and those mm-hmm. kind of things to people. And of course, there were people in the crowd yelling back at him. And I said to, to the kids, you know, you, you know what they, and they're recording all this. The, the street yeah, preacher is making sure it. it's being videotaped. You know, they want to get a rise out of you. They want to put this stuff up on the internet to show you, see, we're persecuted. Yeah. People are persecuting us. You know the way to handle it? Don't. Don't, don't fucking acknowledge don't, it. Don't acknowledge it. Just walk hmm. right by. Fuck him. You yeah. know what I mean? Yeah. I mean, why why play into this this thing? Emotion. Know? Yeah. You know what I mean? Like they want to get you. It's all also riled ego. Up. It's ego on both sides, yeah. in my opinion. You know, you don't want them to be right because you don't agree with them, and they don't want you to uh, yeah. believe that you're right at all because mm-hmm. they want you to agree with them as well. Yeah, it's kind sure. of just this trade off of just ego. It's just so hard for sure. you, you know, for people to let stop it go. that. They, yeah. you know, just let it go. Mm-hmm. So but, this is where again I'm going to just point out another yeah. he- hegemonic thing about Christianity. Christianity a core value or at least a, a core devalue of Christianity <laughs> is is the devaluing of what it means to be human. And mm-hmm. and um that is that is so toxic in the big picture because if I mean we're talking about egos clashing, we're talking about insecurities, we're talking about the need to be right, we're talking mm-hmm. about fear of the other, sure. misogyny, xenophobia, fear of the person of different color, person of different mm-hmm. origin, person of different culture, mm-hmm. and therefore the need for you to elevate your particular DNA or whatever yeah. at the expense of others like white supremacy or whatever. All, all, all driven by self hatred. Hmm. If people got comfortable in their own skin, I'm telling you, you you get re- you relax, and like you basically say yes to what is. Yeah. You look at your human nature. You look at your own fucking hair, eye eye color, <laughs> dick size, uh, skin color. You you look at your life, you where you find yourself, and you, you say, go, well, this yeah. is it. This yeah. is it. I'm I'm saying yes to it, and yeah. I'm gonna I'm gonna make the best of it. But you're also knowing, in so doing, you're acknowledging that these are the battles that I have to fight. Mm-hmm. I imagine everybody else has got a, a, a battle of their own to fight, mm-hmm. and so you back the whole fuck off of mm-hmm. needing to be right and needing to elevate yourself. Mm-hmm. And I think it drives I think it drives extreme capitalism mm-hmm. because it's like there's this fear of being inferior. Oh, I got to get mine, and man. so I got to yeah. have more toys. Yeah, I got to have this or that. Or I'm, I'm, I'm even the fear of death. I mean, the fear of death is a huge thing, as everybody yeah, knows yeah. to me. And so the the very thing that we need most as a species, and that is self, basically the give me the tools to accept reality, mm-hmm. 
and that and part of my reality is me for sure that Probably is my the, first the center part of that's my first yeah. first yeah. layer of reality is yeah. who i'm showing up as yeah mm-hmm. the body i find myself in and the mm-hmm. world the circumstance i find so say yes to that and then you, you just eventually get to where you can say yes and you're not afraid or competitive mm-hmm. uh or you know oh you nihilist Competitive, that's what it's all about, man. My <laughs> well, team against your team. I knew you were going to go there. With that. <laughs> now, the, the, I mean, co- yeah. competition among friends is beautiful, but competition among enemies is evil. Very. Mm, yeah. It's violence. Yeah, mm-hmm. it is violence. As opposed to, let's, let's see who can, first one to the stop sign wins. You know, two yeah. boys that love each other, that's fun. That's great. That's not violence. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But it, mm. it's like, if you don't make it, I mean, the, the loser dies or something? Who knows? Yeah. Oh. yeah. So back to Blake. Okay. I mean, do you have anything that you want to say in, 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 lieu of, or in view of everything that we've just talked about to sum it up? <laughs> not really. <laughs> you guys did a great job of just covering all that. Um, well, let me go. I don't know. On the, on the last point you were talking about, like kind of a, the needing to feel comfortable in your own skin mm-hmm. um, thing, I think... That's the most important thing that people need to realize is that um, you can help other people do that just by kind of being there and yeah. just not Mo- treating them like a pariah or yeah. a piece of shit. Yeah, modeling just, behavior. Is yeah, just fucking be a good person. You don't really have to. Um, you don't really yeah. have to believe in anything if you don't want to. Mm-hmm. You know, and I feel like so many people feel like they need exactly. that to exist. Yeah, mm-hmm. you know, and I'm, you really don't. I mean, I've been non-religious for fucking seventeen years. And I'm doing great. <laughs> like I'm doing, I'm doing fine. I still wake up every day. and I still walk around. It's it's great. Good things happen to me. I meet great people. It's uh, nobody's fighting against me. That's higher than myself. Like, yeah, well, we just not recently put out a show Good with a guy you. named Tim Flynn, and he's oh, yeah. I think he's probably about your same age. And there was a chill factor to yeah. him that was so attractive, and I see it in you. And this is what we're talking about: is you're you're not anxious about anything. Now here's the catch twenty two. I think. At some point in your life, and this is where it's nuanced and you got to find some kind of balance. Mm-hmm. At some point in your life, and especially because of the fucking system we find ourselves in, which we, right. we've already dismantled it's, as It's evil. modernist, the modernist system. Yes. Yeah, mm-hmm. this, it's this Western capitalism. Mm-hmm. Um, we're, we are sitting here with you, Blake. With, we've already, we know that you have this great mind. And and we and Bob is he does this to every guest. You're not unique as far as he encourages everybody to go to college. Yeah, he's he's a big academia. Be- uh, yeah, I believe in it. I do. I do. No, and yeah. I do too. And and I'm just wondering where, how do you find that balance of like chill, and chill, you know, at relax. Don't take yourself too seriously. Mm-hmm. You know, this wonderful predisposition and yeah. and worldview. Just relax right. and be. And right. Just show up as kind and as thoughtful as you can, right. empathic, and just be. And, and but where does goals come in? Where does See, drive? That's, that's a modernist notion. This notion of goals. Like if you oh. go back to college, you're going to have to engage in the modernist system, which is A B C D F. Yeah. Which is hierarchy. You know, you're you're number one. You're lower. You're which is complete bullshit to It's me. a bullshit system, it but is. it's the one you find yourself That's in. That's where we're, we're at. So when you come to my class, it's a different way of doing things. Really? Oh, yeah. I mean, I got to give tests, but don't worry about it. Calm down. Don't feel... Golly. You know what I mean? Don't feel crazy. I'm going to be in his class. I know, down. right? It's a, you know, I'm really serious. I hate testing. I hate all that. I want people to learn shit. I want people to learn and think about things and talk to me, and I talk to them. You know what I mean? Like this. This is a great learning experience. You yeah. Know? And so what's anyway, your what's your yeah. response to my goal question? Like, how do you set goals, and how do you balance the chill with the uh, I've got to I got to somehow play the system? Well, <laughs> you do. The you only, do have to play the game. You do sometime. have to, have to yeah. play the game, and uh, that's kind of what I'm getting around to now. Is like um, I'm finally kind of trying to get back into that world where I'm going to be playing this you know chess game with everybody else for a while again. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. Um, but for me, it was I don't know. I just taking time off and just kind of. Figuring out what the hell's going on around mm-hmm. me and mm-hmm. just at least my definition of what's going on around sure. me helped so much. Because yeah. it took this really like high strung, like clinically depressed kid and Whoa. kind of made him not that way, you know? What like, did? Just, uh, just, just, just experiencing life rather than yeah, just, just kind of just, closing just, myself off. Like, you know, I had friends that kind of forced me into life. Yeah. And mm-hmm. then that kind of just shows you a world that I don't know, like, mm-hmm. if nothing bad's happening, why well, be stressed out? Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, don't expect bad things. When the bad things happen, deal with them then. Until then, just 
Right. Why, why be stressed out of something no, that hasn't happened yet? Plus, you went through to uh, through secondary school too, right? You went through to high through high school. And yeah, I went through it. high school. And everything. So I mean, they they beat the shit out of you in high school creatively. They yeah, just take yeah, everything they, away, they, they make they you all crazy much. and stuff. Yeah, yeah. You know, absolutely, and then you come absolutely. to college for more of that. So uh, yeah, I think you're right. I think everybody should take a few years off before they go to college. Just to kind of experience the world because yeah. you're gonna see the dark shit. You're gonna see the good shit. You're yeah. gonna see both of it, and you're either gonna grow negatively or positively off of it. And that's kind of mm-hmm. your own decision at that point. Yeah. yeah. You know, either you can take everything in stride or you can get mad about everything. Mm-hmm. And why would you want to do that? Because I feel like that just kind of de- detriments your quality of life. Yeah, sure. Well, there is some wisdom to deciding that no amount of my rage is going to change a goddamn thing. Yeah, that's <laughs> when you start just educating yourself. You want to fucking change the world? Educate yourself. Educate everything. Like mm-hmm. education, education, and what energy? Those are the two things that would change poverty completely. Mm-hmm. Yeah. No mm-hmm. more poverty if you just ed- literally put the tools in front of people that you say you're putting in front of them. Mm-hmm. You know mm-hmm. what I mean? Like I have a, a friend who is a, um, or she was a student teacher, and um, her big thing is um, like now she's uh, actually teaching um, in a school in town. I will actually not name that school, but uh, <laughs> um, her big thing is she absolutely hates how kids are being educated now. Mm-hmm. She is hates it, and she's uh, a student taught at um, more perverse uh, schools, and she sees what's going on. Like, this is a very active thing. They're, they're, they don't have books. They don't have, they're not be able to eat during lunch. Like, the school is not be able to provide them with food. Mm-hmm. And that's absolutely, absolutely the saddest thing I've heard in America. Yeah, Like, kids can't eat at school. That's the one place you should be able to eat, I feel like, you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Especially if you come from the households that most of these kids come from. So I think that's the way you change the world. Educate people, especially children. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You know, and the whole like involvement of Common Core is absolutely the most detrimental thing that's happening inside of school systems. Mm-hmm. All you're all they're being taught is like how to take tests, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's it. They're yeah. learning my, answers my and they're not learning thinking. My wife's high school English teacher. Yeah, mm-hmm. exactly. That's like, what it is. No like, thinking involved. Yeah, I mean, no kid left behind. I think it's a complete. Oh, that's just that's a joke. That's it's a, a joke. joke. Like if you don't like if I if I didn't do the work growing up, I didn't get the grade. Yeah, and it made me feel horrible and made me work harder the next time. Mm-hmm. You know, and you that you need that just kind of to challenge yourself, especially through those years. That's interesting because here, I mean, I've just got through saying that I think the most important thing is, in some ways, I I don't know if I like this term, but I was basically yeah. saying self esteem, mm-hmm. and I think the No Child Left Behind was aiming for that because they were they were basically saying we need these kids to feel good about themselves, yeah. mm-hmm. and and giving them an F makes them feel bad, and so we backed off from like. We were. I think your intent was good as far as we're trying mm-hmm. to improve yeah. the self esteem, but you got to let that kid earn it, or it's not mm-hmm. real. Yeah. Right. It's yeah. not real self esteem. Like, you know, mm-hmm. there. You know. You know. Yeah. And yeah. then that kid that worked his ass off the whole semester yeah. is, you know, in the same position as the kid that didn't. Yeah. Doesn't make that it, it, it yeah. doesn't seem fair to somebody who really, really wanted to learn this stuff and who didn't. Yeah. You know mm-hmm. what I mean? You can blame it on uh, upbringing, raising, or whatever you want to blame it on. But mm-hmm. in some way, if you want this one thing, like mm-hmm. to, if you want to pass a, cl- a grade, you need to do that. Mm-hmm. But if you don't want to pass the grade, I don't think as a society we should look at that person and be like, well, you have to. <laughs> it's like, well, you know, this kid doesn't want to learn anything. And I don't. I don't see why I need to force them to. Yeah. You know, you know what's fascinating <laughs> is that, and this is, is that line of thinking, that line of rhetoric is straight out of conservative. That's a Trump. Mm-hmm. That's that, a Trump I mean, we, we just crossed yeah. over mm-hmm. into thinking like a conservative. And that's what I'm saying all along when I was trying to make some points is that these perspectives that we typically can say, oh, that's black and white. I don't associate with mm-hmm. that. Mm-hmm. We, in, especially in the age of Trump, mm-hmm. we have to get more nuanced about saying, no, they're right on that. Yeah, yeah. sure. Well, that's Absolutely. the whole part of, like, problem with like dividing parties. Yeah. Because mm-hmm. everybody sees a color. They see uh, red or blue, yeah. and that's mm-hmm. it. They don't yeah. see the idea or mm-hmm. even listen to it. No, I agree. But, yeah. but all the yeah. while, behind the scenes and in, in our minds, we are bleeding over right and left. Yeah. Oh, sure. Constantly. I mean, this yeah. this whole mouse to the left side of the screen comes out on the right side of the screen. Before you know it, you are thinking just like your supposed enemy. 
Yeah. Mm. And actually, you've got a lot in common with that supposed enemy. Yeah. And this would be a place to start a conversation with that common enemy. Yeah. Or that, yeah. That, that, that. yeah. And we were talking about this on the porch just before we started about how Robert Reich, the former what uh, Secretary of Treasury or something. Mm-hmm. Uh, for Clinton. For Clinton. Was saying, uh, here, here's 10 steps for you to deal with Trump. First, oppose everything he does. Yeah. Do not let anything pass. Uh, you know, uh, start yelling and screaming, having to, you know. And I'm thinking, wait, wait, wait a minute, you know. I don't like him, mm-hmm. but uh, if he has some idea that's really going to be good for smacks, the country, right. let's, oh. you know, that sounds like what you're doing to Obama. Yeah. <laughs> you know it what to- I mean? Why? Totally smacks of Mitch McConnell, and I hate yeah. that motherfucker. Yeah. So <laughs> that's, not, that's not the right way. But if he does um, something stupid, oppose it, of course. Yeah, you know, absolutely. So sure. Like if but he says a- something smart, like let's impose a... Uh, Learn term limitations for Congress. Fuck yeah. 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 Let's do that all day. But let's take birth control off of health care. Eat a dick. Like, get out of my face. Don't do that. Because it's fucking stupid. It doesn't work at all. And, like, yeah, I think that's completely fucking true. Yeah. Like, look at the idea of the person. Yeah, that's what I think. Although, like you said, Cass then said, well, look at who we appointed. That's strike one. You know, strike one. You know. Now we so got to fucking babysit for four years, but it's going to be fine. I think it's yes. going to be fine because I think a lot of people are going to wake up. Yeah, I think Because we're so forced too. to now. Yeah. It's no fucking joke anymore. Bush, like people thought Bush was a big problem, and he was. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I don't think he was fucking even like the tip of the iceberg. No, compared yeah. to Trump, no. Compared to what could happen right now. Yeah. So I think And I do worry about nuclear weapons. Too. Yeah. That's that's especially the with a guy who has Twitter beef and you're the president. <laughs> you've you've argued with people over Twitter and you're the president of the United States of America. <laughs> I know. Well that's 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 kinda of crazy. That's fucking crazy. They should take that phone away from him to yeah, they should fuck, like a little baby. Yeah, like and his wife is on the well, she's on the stance of um, anti bullying and you've married to a fucking bully. <laughs> like the biggest bully. Probably yeah. the biggest troll in the country. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Well, I- irony is alive and well yeah, tell you, today, irony. everywhere. Yeah, and it it is it does kind of make the world go around. You know, I think magnetic poles and like mm-hmm. what mm-hmm. makes things spin yeah, and push and, yeah, and yeah, uh, push yeah. and pull. Yeah, it's we we're we're orating it and we're seeing it. And mm-hmm. you know, as far as especially like this, uh, Pence goes to the theater and oh, and, that's and right. Trump's worried it wasn't a safe space. You know. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> irony is dead or alive. One yeah. of the two. Yeah. yeah, it's alive. That's for sure. Um, wow. Every fucking word. So, yes. how old are you now? Twenty nine. So, back in that car with your dad at eighteen is kind of when you basically felt the permission, you know, maybe to to think for yourself and not just follow the party line of religious. Oh no! You when were... I was twelve, that's when that hit. Okay. Yeah, I, we, we were in. Um, it was uh, whatever the the youth shit uh, on Wednesdays. I, I forget what they call the uh, the uh, head of that. Uh, the our youth minister. Yeah. Um. It. it sh- uh. Him and his wife were up talking to us and whatever, and they were just like, "Anybody have any questions about you know the word or anything like that?" And I was like, "Well, I have one question, um, in particular." <clears throat> so I asked her, um, "What would necessarily happen to somebody who's never really heard this word?" Uh, because to me, for some odd reason, I understood, and I don't know how this happened that not everybody's going to have the access to this thing that we have access to. Right. Yeah. Um, so I was like, what if nobody ever hears about, you know, Jesus or um, right. anything like that? And she was like, well, unfortunately, they're, they're going to hell. And yeah. it's just, I was like, well, that's just not true. It can't be because <laughs> that seems like a really, really fucked up uh, oh, yeah. mind state, even for an omnipotent force. And then the more I looked into it, the more I was just like, yeah, what about all those Hindus and all the Muslims yeah, and all, the, yeah. all, these, and all these great people that yeah. exist? Buddhists and, and yeah, yeah. all that stuff. But yeah. talking to my dad when I, it was probably when I felt more comfortable in my family environment, because they all knew anyway. Uh, we just never talked about it. But talking to him probably made me more, feel more comfortable to talk more openly mm-hmm. with my family about it, because there was always things that, like my mom would do that made me sad like um what's his name joel olstein mm-hmm. uh she would she bought one of his books and I, it, it fucking almost made me cry because mm-hmm. really? this is one of the biggest piece of shit televangelists that exists right now whether people want to believe it or not mm-hmm. um he has said a couple of things where i'm like oh this guy actually could come over to what they would consider the dark side and exists very well and then i see things like the houses he buys and the fucking money he uses that doesn't go back to the community he claims to represent mm-hmm people like that get the fuck out of my face mm-hmm. like and and um and i don't get, get I don't out of my mom's mind with the book. yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> stay away from my mom's fucking wallet please yeah. like just don't put your bullshit out on my family yeah and mm-hmm. um yeah so now like back like when i was younger if i saw something like that i would kind of bite my tongue now you know mm-hmm. um along with being an adult uh just kind of <laughs> talking with him that day it was just like mom what the fuck are you doing yeah, yeah. like uh, I, i'm all down for you to be a, um, whatever religion you want to be yeah. do not support humans like this and yeah. what that fucking actually did was she did a little research on him 
And she fucking hates that guy now. No oh, wow. kidding. Yeah. So like it worked out very well in that sense. You know what I mean? Sure. Like, and but, I'm not going to try to shake her faith. You know, yeah. I'm not going to try to fuck my mom up at that point. Cause you yeah. know, she's in her sixties and she's just happy right now. So yeah. I'm not going to sure. try to, but just, buying all those planes and helicopters and big buildings and stuff. Uh, that's, that's an example that, that shows how, how religious he is. That, <laughs> yeah. God loves that. Yeah. <laughs> I'm really, and he also hates it though. Which yeah. is the weird part. That's kind of the. Well, like, yeah. the I think he the does hate front it. And the backhand of both of those worlds. Like, yeah. But that notion of the prosperity gospel. Yeah. God wants yeah. you to be rich. You know, yay. Yeah. <laughs> those kind of guys, you know? Yeah. Nope. Nope. Um, <laughs> nope. Do you think if anybody actually read, read the uh, the uh, literature, that they would really still be into this shit? A lot of the people, text, the Bible. Like yeah. I mean, I mean, not the people who are higher up making money off of it. Mm-hmm. The people, yeah, yeah. kind of like how like, people paid attention to government. Do you think they'd still let this shit go on? Mm-hmm. If they I really think if they read it, they would be horrified. <laughs> it's so <laughs> and, fucked up. And, yeah. Well, it goes back to like the way both of you were talking about an educational system that teaches mm-hmm. critical thinking versus just how to be right. Yeah. yeah. Right. It's, and exactly. so if they. If and when they read the text uh, on their own, Mm -hmm. it all depends on the lens through which they're seeing it. If they're seeing it through the lens of, I already know the answers to the test, and so I'm, uh, I'm... I'm reading to be right. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. That's that's not going to. They're work. never the, the Bible is not going to throw them off their faith. Yeah. If they're reading as an autonomous agent of moral freedom, mm-hmm. they're going to be an atheist by the time they're re- in reading it. Yeah. At yeah. least agnostic. Agnostic. Yeah. At yeah. least. Yeah. yeah. So one one thing you said that reminded me, and I said it earlier on in the show that my personal deconversion was a death of a thousand cuts, mm-hmm. and you just literally you just what you just said was cutting to me because mm-hmm. I was a youth pastor standing up in front of about 75 high school mm-hmm. kids doing Q&A mm-hmm. with, after like I just did a Bible study or something or maybe it was one of those nights when I just left it open for them. Anybody have mm-hmm. any questions about the Bible? And sure enough, a kid asked that very fucking question. Yeah, what did you say? I had to, I had to say it and I basically said the same thing that your, no your youth pastor They're said. They're all going to hell. But, but the moment that it left my, because they, they, they were basically is this person in a third world that's never been reached by the gospel gonna gonna yeah. go to hell? And I said, I mean, I hesitated. I didn't want to say it. I didn't have, you know, I, I didn't know how to say it. But with like, with a with God's dick in my mouth, <laughs> I, I said yes. Yeah. Mm. And I knew as soon as I said it that, that a hurt. part of me died. Oh yeah. But see, that's what I'm saying. Maybe the difference in me, and I don't know if your youth pastor's wife is still wow. a Christian or not, but the difference in me and some of the people that continue to go on is I at least felt the sting sure. of and the, the abhorrence of that coming out of my mouth and realizing, like you said about something earlier, I don't want to be that guy. Yeah. Yeah. And I didn't. And I, I think I began, I began my exodus that moment. Mm-hmm. And again... Many, mo- many more moments that mm-hmm. pushed me further and further away to where this is not my tribe. Mm-hmm. This is not my story anymore. Yeah. And like you said, when when we when we this when we you, you use the metaphor, I use the metaphor, and then you played on it as far as the plate was put in our. You know, we were hungry. Mm-hmm. Somebody put a plate. When it came up with all these stipulations yeah. or mm-hmm. whatever you said, yeah. Yeah, and right. and it's like God loves me, has a plan for my life. As a little boy, that was music to my ears. Mm-hmm. But then you get into this, yeah, but there's this place called hell that's eternal torture for anybody who doesn't accept it. And it's like, whoa, that's like the asparagus on the plate with the steak or whatever. <laughs> yeah. I mean, like yeah. that's – or no, it's a big turd. Yeah. Asparagus yeah, is asparagus good. asparagus is pretty good. Yeah. So, yeah. No, no, it's a yeah. super big turd with like a heroin needle sticking out of it. And it's like, I don't really want to fucking touch that. So I better fucking abide. So and like, and if they say, it. no, it's part of the plate, it's glued to the plate, or at least it's part of yeah. – you can't – You, you got – Yeah. Well, you can't um, – you don't have to eat it, but you might. <laughs> you know, you, you might eventually have to fucking eat that. Yeah. What is wow. it when you when you choose from the menu your own? Well, it's like a la carte. carte. Yeah. 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 So this is not an a la carte menu. No, this you, is all together. You, if you're yeah. gonna eat Christianity, you're gonna have to eat that big turd with the heroin needle. <laughs> 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 and so you don't. You reject it. You re- yeah. and, like myself. You end up rejecting the whole thing. Okay. Uh, real quick. What is like your si- you got siblings? Yeah. Are they religious? Uh, uh, yeah, every one of them. And how do they feel about you? You guys get along? 
Yeah. Relatively. <laughs> yeah, I mean, like, we're, we're fucking civil, you yeah. know, and um, we try to keep religion out of the conversation because my brother-in-law is a very educated man. He just, he is, um, and he's a critical thinking kind of guy, um, a devout Christian. Um, my sister is a devout Christian um, with a, she has an educated background. Um, she has her master's in education. Um, you know, he's a doctor. Um, so he always wants to have these conversations with me because mm-hmm. when he found one, once he found out I was, um, smart, mo- mostly, a, <laughs> mostly an atheist, um, uh, with like this tendency of like agnostic existence kind of, that just comes from this like hippie community. I've kind of uh, intro my life <laughs> into, but, um, he always wants to have those fucking conversations and I love having them and he loves having them, but she hates that shit. Mm-hmm. She hates oh. hearing it. Um, she doesn't want it to be in her house around her kids, anything like that. Like pretty Pretty much all but got kicked out of her house on Christmas like three years ago. Oh my! <laughs> over that conversation, um, you know. But yeah, sometimes it's sometimes it's fucking weird. Sometimes yeah. it's not, you know. Well, you see it as recreational because you don't have the need to be right at all. And yeah. I, I don't know how mature your brother-in-law is, but he might Very. just see it as recreational. Yeah, he Whereas, just wants to learn. See, this is this is what this is this is another one of those things that people are very different. And I'm that guy. I mean, like, in, and it's in my DNA. In fact, when my mother married my dad, and his two brothers would come over, and they would argue and mm-hmm. yell and call each other names or whatever. I mean, like, it would escalate, and she would come in and just. Like, we need to Calm stop down. this. Yeah, we need really. to do this. And she's like, he looks at her funny, <laughs> you know, uh, sideways and says, oh, honey, we're just playing. Yeah. yeah this sure. is what we've done our whole lives. This is recreation to us. Right. But to her, uh, her dad was rigid re- religious. Um, mm-hmm. um, se- no, Seventh day. He's a Jehovah Witness. Ooh. And it was mm-hmm. very, very rigorous. I mean, mm-hmm. uh, rigid, I should mm-hmm. say. Staunch. And so this playfulness with religiosity was was foreign to her. Mm. Anyway, that kind of shit goes on. Like yeah. you, you know. So you could you could yell and scream and say you're just an idiot. How dare you? Yeah. Nice talk, bro. Yeah, let's, let's, let's get a beer. Leave. Let's Fun. get a beer. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly, exactly. That's cool. That's always been yeah. my. I mean, any anytime I've ever seen that manifest, I'm like, oh, those are my peeps. <laughs> yeah. You know? yeah, yeah. Because it's just fun to. Yeah. Pick each other's brains. Share ideas, yeah. yeah. The one thing I feel like you don't do to a person you respect is the, that whole, um, all right, believe the way you want to believe kind of thing. It's like that's somebody you don't respect. If you're not willing to sit down and argue over different I, a difference in ideas, mm-hmm. right, you don't give a shit about that other person. Yeah. And when we say argue, we're, we're talking like, uh, you know, like the, the, the way they talk it in academia. Argue means like talk about it. Yeah. yeah. Debate. You know, you, yeah, you say your part, I say my part. What about this? Well, what about that? Well, as long as both people you know, are listening. That's those kind of things. And I say yeah. let the emotion in, too. You yeah. Know, yell if you need to yell. So do I, what you need to do. I want to go yeah. back to what you just said. If somebody says, hey, believe whatever you believe, that person doesn't care? In my opinion, you don't. they don't care enough about your opinion to listen. So it's like um, if I took the side of religion and you took the side of uh, non-religious or whatever, and uh, we were just sharing ideas on each one of them, and I was just in, in the middle of your uh, spiel to me. If I was like, you know what? We're just not going to agree. Uh, you believe whatever you want to believe and don't even have that conversation with you. Oh, I, feel I like, see what you're saying. I feel like that's what, how you talk to a child, yeah. not an adult. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Like a kid's like, oh, mom, this is blue. And you're like, no, it's green. It's like, no, it's blue. It's like, all right, whatever. You know, yeah, you it's, give up. it's blue at the moment. Fuck it. Yeah. And you'll learn later <laughs> in life. But like, it's the same way with like adults in conversation. If you're not... If you're not willing to argue with somebody or like, especially if you don't share the same idea, you know, yeah. if, if you mm-hmm. fucking think chocolate's the best ice cream and I think vanilla's the best ice cream mm-hmm. and we're just bullshitting having that conversation and I argue with you over um, forever for it, it's because I, I care about you switching over to my side. You know, yeah. I want you to be over here. I want you to see my viewpoint. And if you don't at the end of it, I'm not going to fucking be pissed at you. But just saying like, oh, whatever. That's bypassing the whole yeah. thing it's, yeah, like, it's like i don't it, even care what and you it's to say. dismissing their agency or like they yes. they've worked hard to come up with this belief and you just dismissed it yeah you didn't yeah. give a shit okay that's nuanced really hard i mean like that's yeah. very leveled because at first i think because we are people that typically we say you are free to believe what you want and i'm not going to tell you what to believe or what to mm-hmm. think you that's you and that's one way of saying what I thought I heard you mm-hmm. saying, you know, because it's actually respectful mm-hmm. of the other person to just say, hey, but when, but the way, you, when you reframed it in the context of this thing where you're kind of like, okay, well, I give up and you believe whatever you want. Yeah. Right. That's dismissive yeah, and, just, and insulting. Mm-hmm. And, and Yeah, it is nuanced, you're right. Yeah, because it's, it's a little of both. Yeah. And then uh, the other thing, there was, because I think motives, I know they're they're tough to nail down and to understand even your own sometimes, mm-hmm. but when you care about that person, 
mm-hmm. and you are in this you're in this engagement of mm-hmm. the the back and forth of ideas that's beautiful when you're insecure and all you care about is being right right then you're going to bring a whole different spirit to that different debate dynamic so yeah. these are nuanced things that's true. yeah that's very true and i tell students in class too look you don't got to buy the you don't got to believe this stuff you got to understand it mm-hmm. yeah this is what this guy said this is what this guy said you see what i mean and yeah. now you got to understand those two things yeah. hold two different ideas in your head at the same time can you do that yeah i believe you can you know those kind of things so we got this wall of uh, quotes here, and yeah. uh, I just I was I thought maybe we'd just go out with like read one of the quotes, and then uh, let's we'll see if we can't sure. unpack it or at least reiterate what we think it means. Sure. Does everybody get one or just no? Uh, just just the just, guest. Just Blake? You don't All get right. one. All right, good. I, I see him every week, so <laughs> I'm good. What do you like, Blake? What do you see? It's a smorgasbord. <laughs> smorgasbord of atheists, right? There. Christopher oh. Hitchens for 300. Blake. Yes, yes. Form of a question. It was between that or George Carlin, but yeah, Christopher Hitchens, since it's obviously inconceivable that all religions can be right, the reasonable conclusion is that they're all wrong, which fucking makes sense. <laughs> yeah. You know, yeah. like not one of them could be right if every god was on omnipotent in the four in the time because one of them would eventually said yo somebody's going to introduce all these other religions to you guys and these are the names <laughs> don't believe in them <laughs> and then i'd be like holy shit he called it yeah. you know all these religions with those names did come up and your text was first yeah. and you did that but i think it never there, happened another way to look at it is like what are the odds that, that you're right <laughs> that a particular re- religion yeah. got it all right that god is literally this and god literally hates pork and god literally hates <laughs> gays or whatever and you got it all right what are the odds and then uh, really one step further back from that is since the odds are so astronomical low, yeah and actually even if they got it 100 percent right it, what does it matter? Well, I guess if it's 100% right, it really does matter yeah, because matters there's a lot. <laughs> the, the high stakes. But but because it's just so unknowable, un, unfathomable, mm-hmm. it's literally debating, you know, how many angels can dance on the head of a yeah, pen. Yeah, it's untestable. You know? Absolutely. Mm-hmm. You can't it's test much it. ado about nothing. Mm-hmm. I, I'm, and the, the shame and the embarrassment for me, Blake, is I gave 39 years of my life to being just rigorously excited and passionate about mm-hmm. this thing that is now in my mind much ado about nothing mm-hmm. and i and i'm so i'm grateful <laughs> that you didn't uh fall for it early on and throw a lot of your years and passions and energy and money yeah. in, into it uh, me too when you put it that way <laughs> you know i definitely don't think you wasted your time you met you know the woman you met and you yeah. had the children you had but I, no, I'd, I'd, I'd get like in some sense feeling like you kind of let yourself down, I guess. Yeah. And especially now, looking back, it's easy to do that. But yeah, no. You know, at the time, I, I'm sure you were happy for the most part. Well, as you know, I'm a, I'm a big advocate of say yes to what is, mm-hmm. and the past is what mm-hmm. is. Just there. And so by saying yes to it, I'm saying okay, the, the the person I am today was shaped by those things, and really the future is going to be laden with embarrassing choices as Absolutely. well so the the fact that the past is laden with embarrassing choices is still no grounds for shame in fact and i might read it offline cuz we're 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 well into an hour and a half here mm-hmm. but um but there i i I've, I've got this you know if you just look at how nobody asked to be born and nobody asked for the nature and the dispositions mm-hmm. and the the right. likes and dislikes and the dna that we we bring there really is no grounds for shame. <laughs> yeah, that's true. There is yeah. no grounds for shame because given your makeup and given the circumstances, yeah. anybody with those same makeup and with those same cir- circumstances would have done the same thing. Mm-hmm. And, and it just goes back to like Sam Harris's debate about free will. You really don't, Nobody really has any choices here. No. <laughs> Yeah, that's very true. We're all just doing the best we can with what we got. Now, I think there's multi-universes where we make those different choices, Mm -hmm. but still. Yeah, all right. So there's some variables that that, that appear like a free will situation. If I was in line and God was passing out stuff and I could have said, hey, uh, make me a little taller and blonder, would you? He (laughs) said, no, I think I'm going to make you four eyes. I think that's what's going to happen. You'll have to, you know, you have to be short and like too much sugar. Here you go. (laughs) On your way, you know. Gee, think, thanks. Yeah, thanks a lot, God. I appreciate it. All that. right, so are you a reader? Um, I used to be really heavy in high school and then uh, 
kind of just like going into the labor world like have kind of makes it when i'm by myself that's not the first thing i think about i yeah. just think about sitting and not thinking for a minute and just yeah. kind of enjoying my time but i just got back into i'm um, reading a little bit uh a book a buddy of mine gave, actually johnny from work uh he gave me a book called uh the good omen and uh it's really fucking fun it's a lot of fun fiction uh, uh, absolute fiction. It's uh, it's about the uh, return of the four horsemen of the apocalypse <laughs> and the birth of Damien. Um, oh, the birth of Damien, which yeah, is six, yeah. six, six. But they the do beast. it. They do it in such a funny way that it's really? amazing, and it's just really fucking funny. And like, I don't know, they, you know, like one of the horsemen owns this <laughs> amazing Rolls Royce. <laughs> And, no, it's a Bentley. It's an old Bentley, like 1929 <laughs> Bentley or some shit. And he like That's drives true. it, drives it around. He's got this banging watch on, and they like yeah. make all these nuances about him, about how he's like this greaser type of car- character, and he's like a smartass the whole time. And it's just like That's characters funny. like that get introduced to you. And oh, really, absolutely. Really cool. yeah. And I like the fact they still call him Damien. Yeah, it's like That's, it was, da- it was either, name is yeah, Damien. Yeah, I believe they named him Damien. Or yeah, something. like, yeah, a, like a prequel. Like, well, yeah, because you know, because the omen, yeah. the, the Damien was the kid's name. So, yeah, yeah. So I guess well, that's you know, the name of it. Blake, what you're naive about is that that book is a portal for Satan to invade your soul. <laughs> Good man, come on in. <laughs> Just join the dance, man. Let's go. <laughs> wow, you're being demonized. You're well, being possessed yeah. by well, demons. Every word you read of that. Yeah. Book. So, is Harry, so is Harry Potter, though. So yeah. be careful. Well, Harry Potter was a lot of fun too. So yeah, I'm really, really happy with that. And honestly, like on the basis, if there is a hell, most likely it's probably going to be way more fun because fucking Hendrix is there and you know a lot of people Bill Hicks is going to be there chilling yeah, Hitch will be down there like, chilling no, I'll have a, they'll I'm going to have they'll great have conversations fi- yeah they'll have it probably air conditioned by then because there's so many smart people down yeah, there yeah they're going to so. fucking invent something they're going to be like you know what we can overthrow this guy <laughs> He's not that fucking smart. He's got some magic and shit, but I've been here for a long time. I'm going to figure this out. You know, yeah. Da Vinci's down there. Da Vinci, have... Aristotle, they're all down there fucking yeah. hanging out. Yeah. So they can yeah. figure something out. They're good. <laughs> Tesla's probably down there. Oh, absolutely. It's like, man, I got this AC current thing, but like on a different scale now because I've been dead for 100, over 100 years. So like, ready to go. That's what about uh, your. Um, Netflix or binge or do you do you, do you watch anything regularly? Uh, I kind of just caught up on everything pretty much that I watch. Well, what's some of your Stranger favorites? Things, obviously, oh, because show. that show is amazing. Like, yeah. They did a great job. Uh, I just finished up the six seasons of uh, Shameless. Um, also, good very show. good show. Uh, other than that, I watched Panda or uh, Kung Fu Panda three last night, <laughs> which is really, great. I thought it was super yeah, solid. It's very really, subversive. Really, really good one. Um, Joe Rogan's new stand up. I'm oh. a big advocate of Joe Rogan. I like that. Oh, I like that human being a lot. Um, so his new stand up really really funny. He actually says uh, touches on religion yeah. or the difference between religion and a cult. And what he said was uh, a friend of his that explained it this way: uh, in a cult, you have a guy that's telling a, pe- a lot of people certain things and he knows it's bullshit and in religion that guy is dead and that was his whole fucking basis and i was like that's actually kind of true like if you really look at any of them do you listen to his podcast um a little bit here and there um it's a four-hour podcast yeah it's so fucking long but like he he has some really credible humans on there he talks about a lot of crazy things and kind of tests your moral content to be honest with you if you really listen to him he'll fucking make you question shit yeah. and i love that about him yeah you know, very intelligent human being yeah. people don't give him enough credit yeah he's a good guy yeah absolutely super yeah. solid one, one more question anybody come to mind in your life that uh is somewhat of a hero a figure that you looked up to that spoke into your life and uh, maybe it was a teacher or a parent or anything come to mind oh so many people Cool. So many people. I, I, I'm, well, you don't have to pick one. Just yeah, maybe. Say, I, I'm an advocate of that. Like um, my chemistry teacher, Miss Bennett. Uh, she was just the coolest. Um, kind of just taught me the the importance of just being a person, and not on purpose. She didn't really teach me that. She just showed it every day, like because she really cared about every student that walked through that door. Wow. And uh, she showed that in my lazy ass because uh, chemistry was really easy to me, but I slept a lot. But she still loved, you know, the fact that I when I focused I was focusing and she tried to nurture that and it was really really cool and she showed me a lot about compassion Uh, my father who has been the nicest person to people I've ever met Mm -hmm. never asked for anything back like he's one of those dudes like the typical old southern man you hear about you know never ask for anything from anybody and he'll bend over backwards for you in a heartbeat whether he knows you or not it's crazy Mm -hmm. that that's probably like the craziest thing I've ever seen in my life. You know, both of those people you mentioned earlier that he was not a judgmental person. And then, of course, this teacher you just modeled. Um, you know, one of the things that I've found historically is that when a, t- a teacher has in her his or her mind what 
a student should look like, the frame, the, the grid. And because humans are so much more nuanced than that, the, the, someone like you comes along who sleeps like occasionally. And instead of taking that personal, and instead of like you, you're not m- matching the grid, um, you know, she, she celebrated your uniqueness and found your strengths and, and, and acknowledged that you were understanding the material. Mm-hmm. And just, again, because of her lack of insecurity and her ability to say yes to what's showing up, and that's a, a variety of different students, mm-hmm. different colors, different shapes, different beliefs, different, and saying yes to reality. I just, I just can't get off that. Yeah, I think yeah, that's beautiful. Stuff. Yeah, Absolutely. I definitely one of the, like I, that's one of those people who deserve kind of like everything. Yeah, you know. And this yeah. was back in ten, East yeah. West Tennessee. Back, back in West Tennessee, uh, sophomore junior year. Is she still there? I hope not. Yeah. <laughs> she should, like at this point, she should honestly probably be retired. Yeah. Um, so I hope that's happening for. Her. But uh, have you ever thought about giving her a call? No, I haven't been back there in four years. So yeah, yeah. I don't. I don't think I'll ever be. I don't think I'll ever be visiting. If anything ever great happens uh, in my life, if I ever kind of get focused and um, follow through on the things that in my head I want to do, um, she's definitely one of those people that's going to be like thanked. Yeah, mm-hmm. probably till the day I die for that. Teachers appreciate that if you. Yeah, well, like uh, let them know. I think kids appreciate it just as much as teachers do when that teacher really gives a shit mm-hmm. and like yeah. actually tries. Um, maybe not even just to reach out, but just to understand that not everybody's the same. And I feel like everybody's so boxed up in these categories mm-hmm. that that just makes people feel good. Mm-hmm. You know, yeah. that's one that teachers like that will always be the best. Yeah, it's amazing. Right. You were great, Blake. Yeah, Enjoy thanks for coming on. No, this was this was really amazing. This was really really cool. Got nervous for no reason. I was like, I don't know what the fuck we're gonna talk about. I don't know what's gonna <laughs> happen. We just today. make it up as we go. Good, pretty man. much. I think everybody's doing that, so it works out. That's all there is. <laughs> That's literally all there is. All right, man. Thanks. Nice. Yeah, I appreciate it. So that's our talk with Blake Coleman from here in Murfreesboro, Tennessee. Great guy. Feels like he's uh, navigating his life and picking his battles well. Appreciate him sharing his story. In closing, I want to read an email from a listener who has an interesting twist on her faith journey. Her name is Jennifer Casey. Hi, Mr. Midgley. I have been listening to your podcast for about seven or eight months now, and I've become a huge fan. While I'm not like many of your guests who've deconverted, I struggled for many years to become a Christian and suffered a lot of anger and confusion about why it just wouldn't click for me and make sense like it does for so many others. I wasn't raised particularly religious, but we did attend church pretty regularly until I was a teenager. When I was a young adult, I went back to church, trying to become Christian. I didn't throw myself into it, honestly believing I would naturally have some kind of epiphany and suddenly feel all the certainty that many of my Christian friends felt about the Bible. My best friend is a Christian who's heavily involved in her church. She had always been the image of what I expected I would be like once my epiphany came. I envied her complete trust in God, despite the discordance I felt about the Bible and God's influence on the world. Well, it all started unraveling when trying to start a family revealed that I had some medical issues that would prevent conception. So we prayed. A lot. In the end, God didn't answer our prayer. Science did. We had a successful IVC cycle and achieved pregnancy. And although we stood up in church and thanked God for our miracle, I became bitter, angry, and confused afterward. I carried around this bitterness toward God for not giving me a pregnancy naturally. I paid thousands of dollars and underwent uncomfortable medical procedures in order to have my babies. I felt like God had cheated me. Finally, though, I had an epiphany. I let go of trying to make sense of a senseless God. The transformation has been revitalizing. Finding your show has added to the peace I feel with my newfound non-belief. One of my biggest conflicts about giving up the search for God was, what if I'm not a believer? The word atheist sounded scary and like something I didn't want to be labeled as. This is something that your show has really helped me with. Hearing the stories of your guests has shown me that atheist is not a dirty word. Goodness and kindness are not dependent on belief in God. And I'm not alone in my non-belief. Thank you so much for the work you do. Your podcast is bringing some good to the world. Sincerely, Jennifer Casey. Well, my thanks to Casey for sending that email. I hope you enjoyed the show, the talk with Blake, the differentiation between yes saying and no saying. And uh, we'll talk to you next week. Mm-hmm.